Hey guys, I know different time. You're used to seeing me in the evening, but I'm here a little bit earlier today. Max Blumenthal will be joining us in just a couple of minutes, but welcome, welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. If you're new, I want to let you know that Savvy Sab's podcast is a part of Revolutionary Blackout Network. You can catch me there on Thursdays for the Savvy and JB show, and you can catch me here on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and every other Sunday. Shout out to everyone watching on YouTube, Rockfin, Twitter, and Rumble, and welcome back, guys. What is going on, fam? Are you ready for the weekend? I'm ready for the weekend. Let's go ahead and give shout outs to people in the chat. Shout out to Hannah says Max exclamation point. Shout out to, uh, oops, sorry. I don't know what happened. I skipped down. Greetings. Miguel says peace. Shout out to CBC voter says happy Thursday. Savvy Sabs. Greetings. New York varsity says listen to Tuesday show on the road back home from a tourney. Terrific. Shout out to Annie or Ani, excuse me, says hello, Sabby and team and everyone in the chat. Greetings, the unsubscribed queen. That's an interesting name. Says, ah, yes. Greetings, Christopher says, dooby dooby do from Seattle. I have never been to Seattle. You'll have to let me know how it is. Is it true? Is it true that it rains there all the time? Greetings, Hugo says, God, I hate looking at Jink. I'm so sorry, Jink. Excuse me. Shout out to Red says early Thursday stream. Let's get it. Hello, Sabby. What's going on, Red? Greetings, Casey Send solidarity and fire. Shout out to Eric T. Red holding down the chat says time for some afternoon live action. Greetings, Metal Music says nice thumbnail. Thank you. So you guys may have noticed. Yeah, I changed my thumbnail actually. Um, Ritual. They're the people that manage me. They actually created that. Um, and I, I did a little couple tweaks here and there, but I think it does look better. <laughs> I told you I have no graphic design skills. They actually are doing a better job. So uh, it's nice to see that you guys like that. Shout out to Retro says morning. <laughs> Greetings, Jovan says uh, doobie doobie do. Shout out to, uh, did I say you said Casey? Hello, gamer. Shout out to Lion Tribe says, Savvy Sabs is in the MF building. Yes, I am here. Shout out to Lawrence says, Shaka when the walls fell. 
Greetings Adonis says 10 seconds. Shout out to Bryce says, good morning, everyone. Morning, Savvy. Bryce, you must be on the West Coast. You're on the West Coast, Bryce. I don't know how you guys do it. Greetings V sends emojis that apparently StreamYard does not show me, but welcome. Shout out to you. Greetings Sophia says, hello, Savvy crew. All right. And a couple others as well. Max is going to be here in just a couple of minutes. I do want to go ahead and show you that thumbnail, guys. Show you what we're going to be discussing while we wait for Max. Again, shout out to Ritual. Thank you so much for creating this. You do a better job than me. All right, today we are discussing, of course, Max Blumenthal is going to be here. He has a lot to discuss about Israel and Gaza. We're also going to discuss Don Lemon actually had a panel debate about whether or not we should support Joe Biden. I thought this was a funny debate, <laughs> very funny uh, with himself, David Pakman and uh, Jank Uger. Also, Brian Tyler was a part of this panel as well. We're also going to discuss Muslim student banned. I don't know if you've heard about the story. This was announced yesterday. This student here. Uh, from the University of Southern California. We're going to talk about what happened to her and this breaking story about the New York Times. Yes, they are busted again, this time in reference to censoring their own staff. So we are going to get into all of those things today. And yes, I thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. Thumbnail looks dope. Thank you. Yeah, I think it looks a little bit more professional. <laughs> I think it looks a little bit more professional. I think you can see the difference between what they do versus what I create in Canva. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh God, lemon. Yeah, I know it's wild, man. Like all the people now that are kind of coming about, um, that were part of mainstream media that now, you know, have their own YouTube shows or X shows. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, I don't really know what I think about that. <laughs> Cause I do still feel like they're still like parroting some of the mainstream media talking points, which I think is concerning. Uh, that's the reason why a lot of us are in independent media because we are tired of the talking points for mainstream media. So those are the things we're going to dive into today. We are also going to host a call in right after this stream, uh, because I haven't done one yet this week and it's going to be on zoom, just like we've been doing for the past two weeks. So that link is pinned uh, to the top of the live chat. So you'll be able to click on that. We'll start it like during the stream towards the end and make sure everybody's able to get into the room. And then we'll do a call in segment for just a bit. Uh, one other thing that I was going to add as well, there was a notification from YouTube earlier this morning. Apparently people had issues with their comments. Apparently people's comments were disappearing, whether it was in the live chat or in the comment section. Uh, they did just receive uh, an update about that. And they said that should be corrected. I guess it is because I see you guys here in the live chat. Uh, but apparently that was an issue earlier. So just wanted to let you guys know about that. Thank you for the super chat, John. Uh, astrologically speaking, Max is part of the Pluto in Libra group of people born between 1972 and 1985. I call it younger Gen X. Interesting. Well, some people, it depends on what you research because there's actually some articles that'll say if you were born uh, 1981, 82, 83, 84, you're still a millennial, but you're called an older millennial. I don't know. These things change all the time. So, but that is very interesting. Uh, John Bryce says, yep, Sabby, I'm on the West coast Vegas. Ah, and so is Leroy. So that's two people out there that I know of in Vegas. Um, ah, to slash says morning, everyone hope everyone is dry over here. It's raining. It was raining here earlier this morning. In fact, it's been late raining here quite a bit. Uh, it bothers me. I really don't like rain. I prefer snow over rain. Retro says, yep. Morning on the West coast. East coast is afternoon. That's right. Uh, Saham says it's great to catch you live. Sally, a uh, savvy welcome Saham. I know some people can't join in the evening. Adonis says she was speaking too much truth, so they banned her. Yeah, we're going to get into that story. It's really scary what's happening to the universities, but I did warn people that this was a possibility. Uh, King says, Sabby, I love your show. Great job. Oh, thank you. And welcome. Welcome, King. 
Welcome, welcome. One thing I do want to go ahead and share really quickly, if I pull it up here, let me just make sure Rumble is good to go to. Okay. Always got to double check uh, with Rumble. One thing I did want to say as well, if you're not following me on my website, SavvySabs.com, make sure you follow me there. I know some of you reached out and you've been asking me if I could create a Telegram channel. I'm working on that uh, because I know that obviously there are a lot of people that are broad that do rely on Telegram. So I'm working on creating a Telegram channel as well. Hopefully that'll be done uh, by the end of this week. I think, yeah, I think. <laughs> I think by the end of this week. Yeah. So follow me on my website, uh, SavvySabs.com. This is actually where you can find everything. Some of you asked me, like, do you have a newsletter? Do you have a Patreon, et cetera? Everything is here on my website. So if you just scroll down, you'll see the about section. I'm not going to get into that. You can read that on your own, but then you'll see a section that shows uh, my merchandise store, my sub stack, my Patreon. Interesting thing. When you sign up for my sub stack, you'll also receive alerts when I go live. So a lot of people rely on that because sometimes YouTube doesn't send out notifications. So that's important to sign up for that. So when I'm live and when I post clips, you'll receive an email. So you can expect two emails from me every day or the days that I'm live. The days I'm not live, it'll just be one email that shows the clips. I'm also working on articles in the future as well. So those of you that are signed up as paid Substack members, you'll have access to articles and I'll also do free articles as well. So just a couple things that working on there, you also see the Patreon link. So this is really the place to go to, to find everything. Um, there's awards there as well. Wow. That seemed like that was such a long time ago. Good Lord. Community organizing information. You'll also find uh, on my website. So these are some of the things that we've done with the RBN Boston chapter. That was the food and clothing drive. You'll also see information about uh, events that I've actually covered on the ground. So Assange, I believe this was a protest. That was probably another protest. And then you'll also see uh, where video videos will actually just populate into this bottom tab here. I actually need to check on that one and see uh, why that one's spinning like that. But yeah, that is pretty much like the best place to go to, to find everything is just that website instead of trying to go to all of these different links. And I do believe that Max is here. Whenever you're ready, Max, if you just give me a thumbs up and we can dive right in. All right. My special guest today is Max Blumenthal. He is an investigative journalist. He's also the host of The Gray Zone. Welcome back, Max. Good to see you. How are you doing? Doing great. How have you been? Pretty well. Uh, just holding down the fort here in D.C. Uh, just trying to retweet this uh, link so everyone knows I'm on. All right. Awesome. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, great to see you. Great to see you too. I know that you were at some of the protests too uh, in DC. I saw pictures of that as well. I think that you're very, very lucky that you live in that area because I feel like there's always protests happening in DC. Yeah, the larger protests were here. Um, but now the protests are sort of just following Biden everywhere he goes. And I've seen some of the more interesting smaller protests here because the Israeli embassy is here, Tony Blinken's house is here, and a really courageous small group of activists started this 24-7 vigil outside Blinken's mansion in suburban Virginia uh, called Kibbutz Blinken. They set up tents, they live there, they have you know food, everything they need. Anytime he goes in and out, <clears throat> they pour mock red paint on on or towards his motorcade and there's really nothing they can do to stop them and that group has been part of a larger encampment outside the israeli embassy and what the israeli embassy is doing i've learned is they're coordinating with this group of thugs like pro-israel thugs many of them are israeli mostly military veterans of israel's military to kind of intimidate and menace those protesters and they've gotten so frustrated they've basically rented out all these moving trucks to block their their to, to kind of block them from being able to see the embassy wow so, so it's you know amazing to see and it's really it's also really getting to the democrats sorry it's kind of hot here 
<laughs> well, oh, I, I'm, I'm in Boston, so it's still not hot here. <laughs> yeah, it's coming your way in a few months, maybe. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I guess I want to start with, uh, you know, last time you were here, there's a lot that has happened in Gaza uh, since then. As we all know, uh, Iran did respond to Israel's uh, attack on the Iranian embassy uh, in Damascus. Uh, and since then, uh, Joe Biden apparently has has kind of like warned uh, Netanyahu not to respond to Iran. I'm sure you probably saw this. Uh, Netanyahu actually issued a statement and it says Netanyahu dismisses calls for restraint, saying Israel will decide how and when to respond to Iran's attack. And I want to get your take on this, Max, because obviously if Israel is to respond to Iran, we're looking at the possibility of, of World War III. Do you think they'll actually go through with that? Well, I mean, I think in some ways we're already in World War III and it's, and, and it often takes the form of gray zone warfare, which is warfare that doesn't rise to the level of direct conventional warfare. We're getting there. We're getting to con towards conventional warfare. Um, Netanyahu delivered that statement in Hebrew, and it was a statement for the consumption of his domestic base. He also said that we'll build settlements in the Gaza Strip. You know, you wanted to surround us. Well, we're going to surround you. I mean, it's a tip of the hat. You know, it's it's sort of a sop to the fanatics in his coalition, who are the linchpin of his coalition, not just us, uh, Smotrich and. Edomar ben Gvir, who are these settler fanatics who only control just a few seats in the Knesset, but who hold the key to Netanyahu's very narrow coalition. But other settlers, I mean, this, the coalition's populated with settlers. So when he's speaking in Hebrew, it's unclear if he's actually, you know, just puffing his chest out. And when he speaks in English, it's usually the case that he's lying. And that's sort of for his international sponsors in Brussels and Washington. And what I think Netanyahu uh, wants to do is calibrate his response as well. Israel and the Israeli public, especially in the condition they're in after October 7th, cannot handle in the near term a direct conventional military conflict with Iran. They cannot handle what Iran has next. And I don't mean necessarily militarily, um, they might be able to withstand the blow, but politically and socially, I don't think, and economically especially, I don't think they can handle it. We've already seen their credit rating get downgraded. Their GDP has shrunk enormously. One reason they pulled their largest division out of Gaza is because these guys are not able to work. They're, a lot of them are reservists, um, and that's weakening the economy. Two entire sections of the country are depopulated and people are being put up in hotels outside Jerusalem and elsewhere. So it's just Israel's in a difficult, very precarious situation. Netanyahu, as much of a fanatic as we might see him as, is much more cautious militarily than other people in his coalition who are even to his left. And traditionally, the Labor Party in Israel has been more militaristic, more gung-ho about direct confrontation with Hezbollah. So I think we are going to have to wait and see. And when I say wait, we have to wait through the spring season in Israel, which is filled with holidays that are used to indoctrinate the public. Uh, Passover, they kind of observe the <clears throat> segregationist genocidal version of Passover that you know, in every generation, our enemies have risen up to destroy us. And uh, God punished the firstborn of our enemy by killing them, slaughter, slaughters the Amalekites and so on. Then they have uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. The Holocaust is a major part of Israel's indoctrination program uh, that if we give one inch to the Palestinians or anyone else, well, it could be Auschwitz all over again. And it's interesting that to note that I don't think a single Holocaust survivor has ever served in Israel in an Israeli government. Then they have uh, Memorial Day, where they observe all their dead soldiers, and there are a whole lot of that there are a whole lot of dead soldiers this Memorial Day to observe, not only because of October seventh, but because of the hundreds they've lost in Gaza. And then you have quote unquote Independence Day. Independence Day is, you know, the deliverance from all of the horrible 
travails that the Jewish people have lived through throughout history. Israel is their deliverance and they're independent. Independence Day, May 15th, happens to be Nakba Day for the Palestinians. It was the day that Palestine was destroyed in 1948. And, and Independence Day is observed in places like Canada Park, which is like a picnic ground and it looks kind of like a forest. It was donated to Israel through the Jewish National Fund by the Canadian government in I think the early 70s, and this was after three Palestinian villages in that area had been ethnically cleansed in 1967. And the point of that park is the villages, the villagers can't come back. They have to stay in refugee camps outside Ramallah. So all of this is happening now in Israel, and it provides a very politically charged moment where anything could happen. But I think we're going to have to wait and see and, and consider all of the factors that are I think um, mitigating what would be a crazy Israeli response, like to try to bomb the the nuclear reactor at Natanz or something like that. I don't even know if they're capable of doing that without American help. Uh, so, and what we'll probably see is, you know, some sort of maybe further assassinations, not on Iranian soil. Uh, Syria is the perfect place for Israel to hit because the state has been so severely weakened by a Western-backed dirty war that was partially designed to help Israel. That's right. That's a really good point. Um, if, if Israel did respond to Iran, then obviously Iran would respond back to Israel. What do you think about the, the other surrounding countries? I mean, where would they stand in this? Because I think a lot of them, like the UAE, for example, is al aligned with the United States, like in particular countries like Jordan, Egypt, the UAE. I mean, where, what would they do? Do you think they would get involved and whose side would they be on? <laughs> well, we saw Israel sort of relying on not just the United States to down Iranian ballistic missiles, but Jordan. Jordan, which is a client of Britain in the United States, whose king is half British, uh, basically came in and saved the day for Israel. They have normalized relations with Israel, and Jordan sort of exists <clears throat> as an extension of Israel to warehouse the Palestinians. So uh, we can expect inaction at best from these kind of uh, pro, the, what you could call the pro Western Arab states. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not extremely frustrated and disgusted with the way that the Biden administration is handling this whole war theater and allowing it to expand. All of them want a ceasefire. They want this to end. I mean, Jordan is being internally destabilized. Something like 70 to 80 percent of the population is Palestinian. The king has had to allow these ferocious protests around the Israeli embassy <clears throat> in Amman. So he doesn't want that. He doesn't want Palestinians in the street. He wants us to go away. Um, the Al-Aqsa compound is managed, like the cameras are controlled by the Jordanian authorities as part of a kind of uh, a compromise with the occupation authorities of Israel. And they are very threatened by what people in the Israeli coalition government like Itamar Ben-Gvir are doing by invading the Al-Aqsa compound. These invasions of Al-Aqsa helped inspire October 7th, the operation that Hamas <clears throat> called Al-Aqsa flood. Yeah. So at this, I mean, it, you know, they're, they're still these, especially Jordan stuck between Iraq and a hard place. They're there to collaborate with the West, but they're being internally destabilized. Egypt as well. I mean, since Camp David, Egypt has basically been kind of a Western neo-colony since the Camp David Accord signed in 1979 between Anwar al-Sadat, then the Egyptian president, who was soon assassinated for this gigantic betrayal of Arab nationalism, and the um, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who is kind of a predecessor to Netanyahu, founded the Likud party of Netanyahu and completely betrayed every aspect of the Camp David Accords. Well, right now, you have this gigantic conurbation of Palestinian refugees. I mean, some of them are able to go home. They're starting to go home now because the Israeli military is withdrawn from um, southeastern and northern Gaza. But they, um, there's still like a million of them in Rafa, right on the Egyptian border. And the Egyptian military, which basically controls the Egyptian state, is furious that Netanyahu wants to go into Rafah. 
and will push those refugees south into Egyptian territory, the Sinai Desert. They've built a wall there. They don't want this to happen. And what, what they're, they're threatening to shred the Camp David Accords, which has really been like the linchpin of Western hegemony in the region. It removed Egypt as the leader of Arab resistance and really left Syria on its own. So all of this kind of hangs in the balance as the Biden administration mismanages the entire situation because they can't defy the Israel lobby domestically and just impose a ceasefire. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're witnessing history being made. We're, we're witnessing the region being remade. That's right. And Max, you tweeted something uh, recently that I think some people may have forgotten about. You tweeted, uh, Israel's 98th division has withdrawn from Khan Yunus. Uh, refugees are returning in mass to northern Gaza where bakeries are reopening. I want to talk about northern Gaza for just a second because I do feel like ever since uh, Palestinians you know, flee to Rafah, we kind of forgot about northern Gaza. I mean, what do you think is going to happen there? Do you think that Israel is going to try to annex uh, northern Gaza? Are Palestinians going to end up moving back to north northern Gaza? What is it in reference to that region? What do you think is going to take place? Well, I know what the Israeli plan for northern Gaza is. It's being upended right now uh, because Palestinians are resisting. And they're not just resisting with, you know, weapons or protests, or political denunciations at the UN or wherever. A Palestinian resistance takes the form of just stead social steadfastness, that the society remains in place and refuses to leave their homes, even if their homes are destroyed. And it's something I saw immediately when I first went to Gaza in 2014, is that in the destroyed areas east of Gaza City, where Israel had just blanketed these areas with artillery during that assault 10 years ago, um, people were just in the rubble of their homes, sitting in the, whatever chairs were left. They'd reassembled their living rooms in like destroyed homes and put up mylar sheets, plastic sheets to cover their home from the wind. And they were just going to stay there indefinitely. And you talk to them and they'd say, this is, you know, I worked my whole life to build this and Israel isn't going to make me go away. So they're all coming back to the ruins of northern Gaza in large streams from the south. And we saw in the initial wave of refugee return, the Israeli Air Force staged a series of mock airstrikes, just did sonic booms over their heads, fired, you know, fired rounds over their heads to try to intimidate them and tell them, we don't want you to come back. Israel seeks to depopulate northern Gaza and create a buffer zone. They want to build a highway slash tank corridor between northern Gaza and the middle and southern areas and push the population south. Um, and right now, it's unclear whether they'll be able to do that. They've clearly failed militarily because their military objectives were very clearly stated from the beginning and were accepted by the Biden administration. Eliminate Hamas and number two, rescue the hostages. Well, they've totally failed there. <clears throat> Haaretz, Israeli newspaper, kind of center-left paper, liberal paper. One of their major columnists, Haim Levinson, who has been a huge supporter of the Israeli military after October 7th, said, we have suffered a total defeat in Gaza. The Wall Street Journal said Israel's on the brink of defeat. So if the population is able to resettle in northern Gaza, and reconstitute itself, and the municipal authorities are answerable to Hamas, that will really consolidate Israel's defeat. Um, and that's, <clears throat> that's why I think Israel's reluctant to just end the conflict. What Netanyahu's saying about Rafa, he needs to go in there to end the final Hamas brigades and have a total victory. Like, who can take that seriously at this point? It's ridiculous. He will cause a bloodbath. Hey, they might kill a lot of uh, Hamas militants there. They're going to suffer some losses. But then, uh, you know, everyone who on October 7th was, you know, every teenage boy who was 15 or 16 on October 7th, who saw their family get slaughtered and became an orphan. Well, if there's an RPG round lying around, they're going to want to pick it up. Uh, so you can't just eliminate Hamas uh, by killing a bunch of people. That's right. And what's what's interesting to me, too, and this is something I've been warning people about, if Israel does annex uh, Gaza, 
you know, if Gaza falls, then all of us fall. Because what does that mean for Syria? What does that mean for Lebanon? What if they go into, you know, take part of Syria and part of Lebanon? I've seen this this uh, video called the Greater Israel Project, uh, where they do want to expand the region. How far is this going to go? And this is why people have to stand up against this. Like people have to push back against what Israel is doing. I think a lot of people, particularly politicians in D.C., they're taking money from APAC, so they're complicit uh, in that way. And then I feel like other people are just, they're they are cowardly. Uh, they're afraid to speak out against Israel, even during a time when they're committing a uh, genocide. But that's one of my fears as well, is that they'll continue to do this, not just in Gaza, look at what they're doing in the West Bank, but they'll try to do this to other countries in the area as well. Well, and that's why Hezbollah exists. It's why Syria has a relationship with Iran. Uh, Syria is an Arab state. Most of the population is Sunni. Uh, it's the one Arab state that really courted a relationship with Iran and has IRGC assets on its soil, along with, you know, it's allowed Hezbollah on its soil, it supported Hezbollah, along with Russia. And it's because they cannot allow themselves to be <clears throat> overrun and they need to seek alliances. Israel has sought since it's before 1948. Let's go back to like 1913. The original charter uh, for a kind of Jewish state set out by the Jewish agency, I think it was, which was originally called the Jewish Colonial Authority, uh, imagined Israel anywhere between the Nile River and the Euphrates River, which is in Iraq. And a lot of the settlers still believe that that's their land, that's biblical land, and they're entitled to it. They don't want to just stop at Hebron and the West Bank. They want to keep going in all the way through Jordan. Um, the Israeli flag, just if you're watching this now, just look at the Israeli flag. It's a very cleverly constructed piece of psychological, uh, it, I, I, I could call it psychological warfare on the Jewish brain. I mean, first of all, it looks like a talit, like a prayer cloth that we wear when we go to synagogue, blue and white, you know, these are sort of like holy colors and you wear them when you pray, you put it over your head. Um, so it, 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 it emulates that, but then there are two lines with a star of David symbolizing the Jewish people in between. And those two lines can also be taken to be the Nile river and the Euphrates river. Pretty much anywhere between that land can be the Jewish state. Uh, so all of those, you know, symbols of our religion have been co-opted, exploited, and now weaponized into this neo-colonial settler flag, which represents the ultimate objectives of the fanatical, incipient religious nationalist forces that are taking control of all of the major state institutions in Israel, not just the government, but the military. Let's look at who was responsible for this insane drone strike on the on the world central kitchen aid workers in Gaza who authorized it the head of that unit who authorized the strike was a fanatical settler who has called for genocide publicly in his own social media postings so these are the people making the calls and making the decisions on the field in Gaza and elsewhere and they believe in the whole greater israel project such a mess, such a mess. Well, one of the things that continues to be repeated is this idea of a two-state solution. When I spoke to Craig Mockheiber, he explained that two-state solution is obviously a farce. Uh, we've been saying that over at RBN for quite some time, actually, uh, that this idea of two-state solution is just an uh, old-school way of thinking. Uh, Biden came out in support of that. He stated that multiple times. So has uh, Nancy Pelosi and I believe Kamala Harris as well. However, recently, The Intercept actually just found leaked cables show White House opposes Palestinian statehood. It says, despite Biden's pledge to support a two-state solution, cables argue that Palestine should not be granted UN member status. And I wanted to get your opinion about that. So again, clearly, Joe Biden is saying one thing to the press and the public, obviously to try to get votes, uh, particularly from the younger community, which he's losing uh, supporters in the young community. Uh, but behind the scenes, he's actually saying the exact opposite. 
Well, I mean, we didn't need that intercept report to know where the Biden administration stands. Um, but, you know, I'm glad they did it. Linda Thomas Greenfield, the UN rep for the Biden administration, has said she will oppose this vote, which I think is going to take place in two and a half hours on a Palestinian state at the UN. The US will just block it. They've always blocked it. Uh, I remember Susan Rice in the Obama administration got up and, and lectured, just was screaming at the Palestinian Authority delegation for attempting to attain obtain observer status at the UN. She was accusing them of wrecking the peace process by trying to become diplomatically viable. They weren't even seeking, seeking statehood at that point. Samantha Power has denounced them too when she took over as UN rep. That's the role of the UN rep at the US is to raise their hand and doom Palestinians. Um, just go look at Linda Thomas Greenfield's Twitter account. I mean, she's saying what they're going to do. She's telegraphing her punches and it contradicts what Tony Blinken has said. And this is the way they've always been. Tony Blinken will go to the region. He'll say, well, we're going to give you all the weapons you want, Netanyahu, all the tank shells, blow some children's heads off. Then he'll go to Ramallah, meet with Mahmoud Abbas, who is sort of the Vichy authority that the US and UK back there and the Gulf states and tell him, we're going to work towards a Palestinian state. We believe in a Palestinian state and they never do it. And whenever the PA attempts to apply for statehood status, which the whole world supports, except Washington. I mean, even the EU states support it. They, the, the Washington blocks it. So it's just a ruse. It's, it's like it, the whole peace process was always a ruse. It was designed to allow Israel to put more facts on the ground in the form of settlements, walls, military bases across the West Bank to seal off the Gaza Strip while claiming that it wants peace and that it's involved in negotiations and it would never set borders. It would never agree to any of the facets of, of nationhood that Palestinians were seeking that other countries have, and it never will. And even the person who signed the Oslo Accords from the Israeli side, Yitzhak Rabin, in his final speech before the Knesset, before he was assassinated because uh, he was seen as too pro-peace, his assassination was incited directly by opposition leader Netanyahu. In his final speech, he said, we will give the Palestinians less than a state. So that's the most the Palestinians have ever been offered is less than a state. So it's time to, uh, I mean, no, no one is fooled or bamboozled or hoodwinked by the Biden administration's hackneyed, recycled lies that we've been hearing, I guess, since the George H.W. Bush administration about a Palestinian state, the young generation that is out there protesting is not falling for it this time. Like the, like the, a certain, like my generation fell for Obama. Right. Right. No, I totally hear you. What's interesting, too, is that we're looking at other countries around the world. Nicaragua actually just recently decided to take Germany to the in front of the ICJ. Uh, I want to hear your opinion about that. And then also the ICJ, they've been kind of silent since they told Israel that they had to submit that report uh, within 30 days about the progress that they've had in Gaza and that they de needed to do everything that they could to prevent uh, a genocide in Gaza. And then they were just kind of mute uh, from that point after everything that has has happened. What do you think about Nicaragua trying to you know, jump in here and actually make a statement and bring actually Germany to the ICJ, considering also that protesters in Germany are being arrested by German police for having a pro-Palestinian uh, point of view? Yeah, we have an interview up at the Gray Zone. It's on our YouTube channel. It's on, a full transcript is on our site, thegrayzone.com, with Carlos Arguello Gomez, who is the Nicaraguan ambassador and lawyer who argued that case before the International Court of Justice, basically challenging Germany's what it calls its reason to exist, which is you know to support the state of Israel in and in, in memory of the Holocaust, and just turning it on its head, yeah. and accusing Germany of the facilitation of genocide. And the case is moving in a very successful direction as the South African case does. And you can see these countries from the global South, which have suffered enormously under apartheid, under the boot of US empire, are now asserting themselves in a new, increasingly multipolar era. And they're challenging the underpinnings, the, it, not just the political underpinnings, but kind of the moral underpinnings 
of imperial transatlanticism. The idea that Germany is actually has uh, operating is operating from the moral high ground and has dealt with the ghosts of the Holocaust is being shredded by this case, which shows that is that Germany is the second leading supplier to the Israeli military. And it's actually very close to the United States. It's right behind the United States in how much it supplies to Israel. 47% of military aid that goes to Israel comes from Germany. That's enormous. That's actually more than I actually, that's more than I actually thought. And it's not just aid, it's tech. Um, it's also you know, financial aid, loans, but dolphin class submarines, I mean, uh, fast boats, uh, I mean, cruiser class boats, uh, all, all sorts of naval ships that, that the Israeli Navy uses to attack fishermen trying to feed their families off the coast of Gaza. They all come from Germany in the form of Holocaust reparations. It's disgusting. Um, trying to remember the name of this German. He was a uh, Gunter Grass. There's this famous German author, one of the most famous post-war authors in Germany, Gunter Grass. And he wrote a poem in maybe about 10 years ago, highlighting the irony, the sick, twisted irony of the fact that Germany is giving Israel submarines that are capable of firing nuclear missiles at Iran as Holocaust reparations. The irony that, you know, in order to make up for the damage Germany's Nazi military machine did during a war, they're helping to create the context for another war, a World War III, a nuclear war. And Gunter Grass was destroyed in Germany as soon as that poem came out. The German press unearthed Gunter Grass's um, participation in the Nazi Wehrmacht. He had actually served in the Nazi military, like all German men were forced to do. And that was sort of the end of him. And he was never going to win awards again. And now we see 10 years later, Jewish anti-Zionists who are German are being brutally beaten at protests. Germans who are organizing against the genocide are being hauled out of their homes in the night. Their homes are being raided. Organizations like Samidun, which helped to organize support and solidarity for Palestinian prisoners languishing in Israeli dungeons, being tortured. They've been formally banned in Germany. Their homes have been raided. Their money's being seized. Uh, this, this conference, this Palestine conference last week that Yanis Varoufakis was due to speak at, has not has not it was not only shut down by 2500 german cops 2500 cops for a conference varoufakis is himself being told that if he comes to berlin he will be prosecuted for anti-semitism and supporting islamism <laughs> hassan abu sita who is a doctor who uh, a british citizen who is in gaza saving lives for something like 3 months during the genocide operating on children who has had their legs and arms blown off and who has now been made rector of Glasgow University, was arrested, was basically detained at the airport in Berlin, held for several hours and interrogated, and then told that if he ever attempts to come to Germany, he will be jailed for a year. So this is, this is what Germany is willing to do to protect its so-called reason to exist. But what the Nicaraguan state has done and what these uh, German citizens who won't go along with the phony mythology of post-war Germany as this real liberal democracy uh, and are protesting the genocide that Germany is supporting. What they're doing is they're, they're just lifting the mask on the international, the liberal international order. And when I, when I asked Carlos Arguello, the lawyer who's arguing this case, like, what can you actually do to enforce a decision against Germany? He said, well, we may not be able to enforce it, but this, this case itself is helping to raise consciousness across the globe, which will eventually lead to a major geopolitical shift. And I, I agree with that. It's interesting as well, because uh, one of the things that people like uh, Rabbi Shmuley uh, has said is that, you know, basically, if you're you're Jewish, but you do not support Zionism, then you're like a fake Jewish person. I want to get your perspective about that because there seems to be, uh, I don't want to say a misunderstanding. I think he knows exactly what he's doing, but 
when you make that kind of argument, then it's like, that's the reason why the police in Germany and uh, some of the other authorities feel like they can go after people like that are part of Jewish Voices for Peace. For example, uh, Alan Dershowitz made this statement on Rising and said, those aren't real Jewish people. It's really sick. It, it's really sick and it's really pathetic, I think, uh, the statements that people like that are making to make it seem like because they don't support this, I, I consider it to be a supremacist ideology that they're not Jewish. Yeah, it is. Um, basically, what Zionism has done is it allows the Israeli interior ministry the right to decide who is a Jew. And a lot of Jews are actually being deported at the frontiers of Israel because the interior ministry says, oh, you're an anti-Zionist. You've been to the West Bank. You're not a Jew. And it gives a moral authority to um, confederates of Jeffrey Epstein, like Alan Dershowitz, who says that he kept his underwear on while receiving a massage from an adolescent on Epstein's Island, uh, gives them this false moral authority where they can denounce other Jews simply because they are not supporting this genocidal apartheid neo-colony. doesn't matter, you know, how religious you might be as a Jew. It doesn't matter how many mitzvot or good deeds you do, your fidelity to studying the Torah, like the ultra-Orthodox non and anti-Zionists. It doesn't really matter what kind of a good, what, how good of a person you are. It just matters. The only thing you need to do is support genocide. Um, and you look at these characters who are still putting this forward. Just look at the freak show that's being put out there to propagandize for Israel. Sh Shmuley. I mean, this guy's a walking anti-Semitic stereotype. He is spreading anti-Semitism every time he breathes. He's representing himself as this celebrity rabbi who signifies the ultimate Jew. And he's a repellent figure who actually went on Purim, this Jewish holiday where, you know, we it's like our, our Halloween. And he dressed up as an anti-Semitic stereotype. He literally became the essence of what he truly was in order to continue spreading anti-Semitism. Why would you want to do that? Well, actually, it makes perfect sense when you consider that without anti-Semitism, Israel would have no justification for its existence as a sanctuary for Jews. We'd all just go to the U.S. and just be normal. We'd be like Episcopalians. I mean, we kind of are. If it wasn't for like this, this monkey on our back, Israel, that's always stirring things up. And all these organizations like the ADL that are creating all these fake anti-Semitic incidents, a oh, 3,572% increase in anti-Semitism. Uh, and then you look at their statistics and they're just classifying people chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free as an anti-Semitic incident. You realize they're just, they want to create anti-Semitism. They want anti-Semitism to be there because without it, their entire political vision, their political network, and their, their, the, the state that their entire identity revolves around will no longer have a justification uh, to exist. And it really doesn't. And from my point of view, they say you're not a real, you know, you're not a real Jew if you're supporting the rights of Palestinians to just like walk outside of their, you know, to be free range Palestinians, to walk outside of their concentration camp. You're not a real Jew. I mean, fine. You, you're, you're welcome to call me that. I don't see them as real humans. I actually see Zionists as demons. Uh, so it doesn't affect me anymore. I never really did. Uh, but that's, that's, what we, that's what we really need to do, especially uh, you know, Jews who are new to this kind of activism, who might be going against their community and their family, is you need to just get to that point of resolution um, psychologically, politically, and spiritually, uh, cause they're never going to stop coming at you. And I think more than ever, the younger generation, not just of Jews, but in general, they're more immune to these allegations of anti-Semitism than ever before. And the prop, there is a problem there though, cause there are real anti-Semites. I mean, I see it on social media more than I used to people mm -hmm. who conflate Jews with Zionism. Their, their belief is that the real problem is Jews and Judaism here. And that you know, Zionism is just the essence of Judaism. It's not about colonialism or imperialism. And they're more able than ever before
to just shrug off the allegation or the accusation of anti-Semitism because lunatic fraud meisters like Shmuley Botiak have rendered it meaningless by just calling everyone an anti-Semite. Yeah, I totally hear you there. I know one of the things you said recently on the gray zone, you said Zionism is the most toxic form of identity politics uh, on the planet. It's basically identity politics enforced through violent demographic engineering. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And when you think about these organizations like APAC and the ADL, they seem to have a lot of control. I mean, when you're buying uh, Congress members uh, in D.C., and these Congress members are, are afraid to speak out against Israel because of uh, the power of APAC and, and how many people they have bought in Congress. That is very telling. When I hear people like Richie Torres and Hakeem Jeffries, you know, praise Israel and care about helping Israel more than Americans here in the United States, it's, it's very troubling to me. And I wish more people could see this. There, there is a group on uh, Twitter called Track APAC, where they're basically announcing all these politicians that are taking money from the Israeli lobby. But I think that, you know, a lot of this just goes back to uh, you have, there is this ideology called Zionism, which has somehow uh, transferred into organizational power and they have been able to buy up politicians uh, in our country. And from what I understand, the UK also has its own version of APAC. Uh, but I wanted to talk about what you mentioned there about uh, Zionism being uh, the most uh, toxic form of identity politics. Well, uh, look at what our, what USC is doing to shut down Asna Tabassoun's speech. This is the valedictorian who is Muslim uh, and specializes in genocide studies. She said she's dedicated to human rights and they don't want her to get up there and denounce Israel for committing genocide because they're going to lose big donations. That's what this is about. And they throw a bunch of Jewish students out there as kind of human shields for the whole operation. Like, and they'll get like 10 or 20 whiny, rich Jewish kids up there to say they feel threatened. And they use, what is the argument they use? I mean, this is their cover for the whole thing woke politics that she threatens the safety of these jewish students that's what the right always mocked about you know leftist leftist and liberal college students is that they need trigger warnings for everything they need safe spaces and now the right the republican leadership in congress at least stefanik mike johnson they're hauling columbia university's president before congress and saying she makes jewish students feel unsafe so basically it's just woke politics for the rich, uh, the affluent, the mostly white and the comfortable. And that's what Zionism has become in the modern age. And that's why I call it sort of the terminal, the terminal stage of identity politics. This is like the worst place that identity politics can go because it's being used as cover for the demolition of whatever democratic rights we have left in the U S and across the West the liberal democratic West and to uh, pro provide justification for a genocide of people basically living in a death camp. Uh, there's, there's, there's literally no difference between the kind of arguments they use and the arguments that, um, you know, blue haired, progressive, uh, black block, whatever students in, you know, postmodern, uh, Frankfurt School news, uh, you know, uh, you know, critical th theory types would use uh, to shut down a right wing speaker. I mean, I'm using like the language or the the stereotype of the right just to show how silly they all are because they all support this. They're complete frauds. I mean, Ben Shapiro, what is his his logo? I mean, his his motto: "Facts don't care about your feelings." Yeah. Well, all he's talked about since October seventh is his feelings in order to shut down the facts and his feelings are so fragile. He just has this fragile ethno-religious identity that that towers above everything else. Black people aren't allowed to complain when, uh, you know, the, some cops stand on a guy's neck and asphyxiate himself. No, no, no. They're, let's, let's focus on maybe that guy was on, uh, you know, was popping pills or something. Ben Shapiro will go on for days about that BLM, whatever. As soon as Jews feel threatened, everything, nothing else matters. And um, 
Okay, nothing else matters except Ben Shapiro's feelings and his identity. And this just goes for all Zionists. So um, what are uh, what, what they're actually doing is using that as a smokescreen. They're using woke politics as a smokescreen for their real agenda. And their real agenda is to create an exception around the First Amendment where those of us who support, I don't want to say support Palestine, but support like basic rights for Palestinians, exist in a state of exception and cannot speak in institutions where Zionists exercise political control, which is pretty much all of the major political institutions in this country. And, and therefore, the Zionist billionaire and millionaire class has a veto over the First Amendment which means there is no First Amendment. It doesn't apply to everyone. And therefore, there is no democracy. The First Amendment is the one thing, I think, that makes America special. Uh, oh, you know, the UK doesn't have it. Germany doesn't have it. We still have it. We can, we can at least kind of leverage it. We can leverage it to argue for the freedom of the press, for the release of Julian Assange, for so many things we believe in. And they, the, the Zionist millionaire and billionaire class, the Israel lobby, on behalf of a foreign apartheid state 5,000 miles away that's engaged in a live stream genocide, want to obliterate our constitution with a political drone strike. That's, that's what this is about. So we need to see past all the, 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 the woke arguments they're using and point clearly to what their agenda is. And that's right. And the other thing I wanted to bring up as well, uh, in reference to Ben Shapiro, it's really also interesting. We're now seeing a number of uh, right-wing conservatives that actually supported uh, the Daily Wire's uh, outlet now being critical of Ben Shapiro with, along with the firing of uh, Candace Owens, uh, who knows where, where she's going to go next? Because the reality is now that she's spoken out against Israel, there's not that many other outlets that she can go to. She can't go to Fox News. She can't go, like if you look at mainstream media, uh, she can't go to the Blaze uh, TV because again, they're all in line with uh, with Israel. So uh, that'll be interesting to see what happens with her. But it is really revealing when you see that the ADL was behind the TikTok ban, uh, when, that, when that's revealed. It's interesting how our government can move mountains when it comes to the state of Israel. They can pass legislation very quickly to support the state of Israel, but they can never do this for the American people when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to education in this country. We're all told the same thing, which is how are you going to pay for it, uh, et cetera. But they have the money to pay for and protect uh, the state of Israel. And it, it is very concerning. And it does scare me in reference to free speech because look at where we are now. I mean, I'm watching people get suspended on Twitter because they said something that someone thought was uh, anti-Semitic because they called out Zionism, people losing their accounts there, people being restricted uh, on YouTube and other places as well. And it just, it goes to show you again that now we we could possibly have some type of bipartisanship with the people in the streets when it comes to this particular issue. Now that right-wing conservatives are starting to speak, speak out against Israel in reference to Christianity uh, because of that interview that Tucker Carlson had uh, with the pastor uh, in Bethlehem. So it just goes to show you again, I don't think anybody in this country really wants to be silenced. Uh, I don't think anybody in this country wants to, or most people in this country, I don't think want to put the state of Israel before the needs of the American people. But here we are. Yeah. We're in a we're in a new place in this country than I think we were 10 years ago. Um economically the situation is just dire. It's very dire. Most people are not going to be able to buy a home in this economy. Uh credit card debt of Americans has passed 1 trillion dollars for the first time in history. The consumer price index was so bad that inflation is going to go up. And, you know, before that, we're reading all these reports in the Wall Street Journal about how Biden and, you know, his chief economic advisor, Jared Bernstein, had had stuck the landing. They were, they were gonna, they were readying for a soft landing where inflation was gonna go down. And then they were gonna, they were gonna lower interest rates. So Americans could buy homes again and be middle class and they could start borrowing again. And it's not happening. It is not happening for a while. Um, 
people are just struggling to buy basic goods and groceries. And this is kind of a point of unity for people on the right and left because pretty much everyone's living through it. They're definitely weaponizing cultural issues, uh, particularly, I think, particularly this fake right wing element that passes for America first is weaponizing it. And it's come, you know, it's coming from the Daily Wire. They use cultural issues as a mask for the fact that they support the establishment, whether it's on Ukraine, Israel, or the neoliberal austerity project on the economy. Uh, and who's backing them? Billionaires and millionaires who support the neoconservative agenda. They basically astroturfed the entire mainstream alternative right. They have like podcasts in these fancy studios. They kind of, they imitate the, the aesthetic of alternative media. I mean, uh, the Daily Wire, which some on the right are correctly beginning to call the Israeli Wire, they, they're a perfect example of that. And you've got Matt Walsh, who his whole career is based on fixating on trans people. Like that's his kind of claim to fame. He obsesses over it. Whatever you think about it. I mean, the guy thinks about it to an unhealthy degree, whatever you think about this issue. And he's become kind of Ben Shapiro's top defender. You know, he's not Jewish, so you can't accuse him of just being a Zionist because he's Jewish. Um, and he has nothing to say about these real issues that are facing Americans. He wants elections to be decided on bathrooms and drag queens and so on. And I'm not saying these aren't real issues for parents, but increasingly in this country, there are elements that either identify with the left or the right that are looking outside this country and beginning to take an interest in international politics in a way that they haven't before. Uh, they're following international media, they're following alternative media about the world, and they're really concerned about the fact that on the right, they're up in arms. The, the, the real like base of the right is up in arms that Mike Johnson, the speaker, has just given $50 billion to Ukraine. $8 billion of that is going to pay the salaries of Ukrainian public workers and teachers and pay their pensions. That's our tax dollars. It's not coming back here. They can't even say, oh, it's all going to come back to Lockheed Martin. And anyway, those jobs are for the upper middle class and the upper class. It's not, you know, that that that's not a real economy. Um, right. People who work in the arms industry tend to be more higher, like high skilled. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's an economy of death. It's a necro economy. But anyway, 8 billion. Yeah, that's paying Ukrainian teachers. We're not getting paid here. Uh, then you got um, banning TikTok. So they're screwing over all these young Zoomers who find like one place where they can have a voice, one yeah. place where they can express themselves. They're just going to ban that. And they're banning it because of what they're saying on Palestine. Let's be real. That's one major reason. And they've said so. And what else is in this bill? Oh, FISA. Okay. Well, we now are basically being forced to spy on one another. And uh, we have to agree to these phony secret courts where... Uh, they only deny something like 1.8% of requests to spy on Americans. So we're living in a surveillance state. And then there's all the money for Israel. We have no say over that at all. And so there's this feeling not only of being economically disempowered, of having no chance of kind of coming up in class and achieving the American dream, uh, but also feeling a voicelessness among the you know Gen Z and millennial generation. And that's what I see is really behind these intense protests around Palestine. Yeah, it's about Palestine, but they see Palestinians kind of as the canary in the coal mine. And they, they, they're correctly starting to understand that there's this project of global Gazification where everybody, where increasingly there is an elite class that lives in this hovercraft reality, gets to own, you know, they're the ownership class and they float above the rest of us in total safety and security. And then everybody else is kind of warehoused uh, and, you know, is, is left fighting for the scraps. And so they identify with Palestinians on a visceral level. The, the, the right maybe not doesn't play it out in the same way, but you're just starting to see on the right that at least they understand the contradiction between being America first and supporting this ironclad support for Israel, the pro-Israel consensus. 
and they're starting to oppose the Israel first elements in their midst. And, um, you know, as John Fetterman said, uh, in relation to the assassination of an Iranian official, I'm here for it. One more thing for you, Max, because I know you I know you have another show, but I was just going to ask as well. Um, a lot of people right now are saying, well, I know everybody's upset with Joe Biden in reference to the genocide in Gaza, but ugh, come on, do you really want to get Donald Trump? He's going to be even worse. Like <laughs> they're trying to uh, do the lesser of two evils when it comes to a uh, genocide. But I argue with people like you do have other choices. You don't have to support Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And I feel like now's the time to fully get people to break away from this two party system and support one of these third party your independent candidates. And I want to get your take on that. Well, I mean, I can't vote for Donald Trump or Biden. I just can't do it. It's kind of like, it's just weird. It's like you get into a booth and there's a religious dimension to it. It's like you're in a confession booth or something and you're supposed to, it creates this psychological context where uh, you have to really go deep into your conscience, but they want us to just hold our nose and oppose the bad orange Hitler and then vote for all these other corrupt cronies all the way down the line. I mean, who do we have in DC? Like every official in DC pretty much where I live is just a complete uh, machine hack who is controlled by big developers like our mayor. Like no, th th there's, there's nothing really there. So how do you protest that? I would think the best way to do it is to find a third party candidate who's on the ballot where at the end of the day, after election day, when the votes are counted, the pollsters, the pundits will say, well, the, re the reason people voted for Jill Stein was anger with Biden's support for Israel's policy on Gaza. And it will send a message at least to the Democratic Party that they can't continue to take so many people for granted. That's what uncommitted is about. Um, but it still feels hopeless because I don't actually think they're going to listen to us even after they lose. What they're going to do is they're going to blame Hamas for Biden losing. And they're going to they're going to blame everyone like they blame the hippies and, the, you know, they blame the weather underground for George McGovern's 1972 loss. And then they continuously move the Democratic Party right until they got, you know, Bill Clinton, who in his final act before his final act on the campaign trail, he rushed back to Arkansas to execute a mentally disabled black man, Ricky Ray Rector, who didn't even know he was being executed when he had his final meal, uh, just to show that he's tough on crime. So like, what do we do to get out of that? I mean, I think you still have to do something, but what I think needs to be done long-term is to build better independent parties um, at the grassroots level. And I mean, right now, I mean, I, I would kind of put this to you since we're wrapping up here, but um, who do you think the best protest candidate is? I see Jill Stein being one of the only ones that's on the ballot in swing states. Yeah, this is something I mentioned in, on Rising as well. Like we got to look at the reality of the situation is that Jill Stein does have the most ballot access and that will most likely continue. She's done this before. She knows how to get ballot, ballot access. She knows what it takes. Uh, so there's that. And she's been obviously very outspoken and vocal uh, in reference to the self-determination and the rights of the Palestinian people. So that would be the person I, I would urge people to go towards. You know, I was really excited about uh, Dr. West campaign in the beginning. There's been a lot of movement uh, from party to party. And then there's just the reality of ballot access. And I told people the same thing about RFK Jr. The reality is he doesn't really have the ballot access either. I think he's only like one or maybe one or two states. And he's horrible. Uh, on this issue of Israel and Gaza. So I, I would sincerely hope that people would consider uh, not staying home and coming out to support someone who is uh, correct on this issue when it comes to Gaza. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think as the two parties are increasingly discredited among younger politically conscious people, we'll start to see more talent emerge in independent politics. Um, and I think we need to, you know, support and cultivate that talent, that kind of charisma, someone who I think is a real model, uh, for breaking through 
in a different system, which may, might provide more opportunities for breaking through is George Galloway in the UK and what he's doing with the Workers' Party. Um, so that's that's someone to watch or to learn from. And not another billionaire. We don't need, I see people recommending Mark Cuban. We don't need a, <laughs> we don't need another billionaire. <laughs> What's Mark Cuban? I mean, what does he even represent? I think he sold, didn't he sell the Mavericks to Sheldon Adelson's like, uh, business empire? I, I think so. He also bought a town in Texas. I don't know if people understand like how much money you have when you're a billionaire. This guy bought an entire town and had no plan for it. Didn't know what he was going to do. He just felt like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's what they, that's what they're doing. Like, you know, um, Rotan off Honduras. Uh, it's sort of like this crypto, sovereign island and all these billionaires that's their that's the future they're going to try to buy up land and towns and then make them sovereign sort of libertarian no go zones for regulators so you know that's what you get when you let billionaires take over politics uh, mark cuban is part of the problem i agree anything cool coming up max uh for you or the gray zone i wish uh just uh, more genocide <laughs> And uh, we'll, I don't know, we'll be back for another live stream soon. I'll be on uh, Judge Napolitano in 50 minutes. So check me out there, unless you're still streaming and then don't. Just keep, <laughs> keep, it, keep it here, keep it locked. Awesome. Thank you so much, Max. Thanks a lot, Savvy. Bye. Peace. All right, guys, that was Max Blumenthal. Always a pleasure. Of course, when Max is on, it's very informative. You guys know that. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and smash the like button, guys. That helps me out with the algo. If you're new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. We're going to go to some of the comments here, and then we have three more stories that I do want to cover as well. And we will do call-in right after the show via Zoom uh, for those of you who want to chat with me. Uh, Trauma Queen says breaking police have begun arresting Columbia University students at their solidarity encampment. Yes, um, I'm hoping to have Professor Zinkas to come on tomorrow night. I did reach out to him. He's going to check his schedule to talk about that because he teaches at uh, Columbia University. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Troy, so much for the Iron Dome. Some of the missiles still couldn't be tracked, even with the best systems. Uh, Iran used their old missiles and still got through, though. Well, According to mainstream media, they're saying that the Iron Dome did stop most of them. Uh, so there's that. Uh, New York Varsity, thank you. Right now, many Israel supporters are yelling, that all you got, you missed. Do they truly not know any better? That is a good question. Thank you for this as well. Max explains the most careful military in the world operates. SMDH, thank you for the super sticker, Napoleon. And thank you for this as well, New York Varsity. Shmuley is the human stain on the underwear of life. He is about making you hate a people. Easy to go to war if you hate a people. That is a good point. And NH Libra says, great interview, Miss Sabs. Thank you, NH Libra. Let's get those comments on Rockfin. Thank you so much for the comments on Rockfin and the tips, Dave. Thanks, Savvy and Max, for this depressing as hell coverage. <laughs> Good coverage, horrifying, of course. Thanks for the real coverage. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and give a shout out to uh, Savvy patrons. Thank you guys so much for your support. You're keeping the lights on around me. You're doing the damn thing. If you're interested in being a Savvy patron, I have five categories. Ultimate, Sabinators. Don't forget about Sabsters. There's also Sabbies. And of course, there are members. All of their names are listed here. And you can also see their names scrolling across the bottom of the screen there on the ticker. Thank you so much. And I believe I shouted out new Sabby patrons last time. Thank you. We are continuing on because I do have three other stories that I want to cover also in reference to this issue with Israel and Gaza. So I want to get started with the Muslim student that it was banned from commencement at the University of Southern California. This started actually the other day, shout out to Philip Lewis for shouting this out. USC announced that valedictorian Asna Tassabum's 
uh, Tabassum, excuse me, commencement speech has been canceled, stating it was necessary to maintain the safety of our campus and our students. I'm surprised that my own university abandoned me. That was the statement from Asna there. So I think we know what's going on here, folks. Apparently, they don't appear that or feel that her presence at commencement as the valedictorian uh, would be safe for certain people. I bet you can guess why. Asna actually was on CNN to discuss this. I'm actually surprised that they brought her on CNN. Uh, this is very disappointing. I have tried to warn people. Uh, where this was headed with the cancel culture, with Zionism, uh, and with anti-Zionism. First, it started with the press, where they were coming after journalists. They're coming after, you know, different channels, different shows, et cetera, targeting accounts on Twitter, targeting accounts on TikTok. And then it was only a matter of time before they would come after the universities. So the first university I saw them come after was Harvard University. They were coming after students there, telling these students that they should leave Harvard University, uh, telling President Claudine Gay that she should step down and resign as president of Harvard University. But I told you that Harvard would not be the end of this, that this was going to spread to other universities. Columbia University has had several students protest in reference to Israel's war in Gaza. And now you can see that they are continuing to move on with this, this further cancellation for people who are supporting the Palestinian people by banning their own valedictorian who is also Muslim. Let's get into this. Joining me now is Asna Tabassum, University of Southern California valedictorian. Asna, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my understanding is that this week you met with university officials to address security concerns. What happened in that meeting? Did they tell you about any specific threats? No, actually they did not tell me about any specific threats and my request to ask for the details of such threats were denied. And so um, it, it leads me to consider whether the decision to revoke my speech was, on the ma was made on the basis of safety alone. So you just heard her speak. Does she sound like someone that you should be afraid of? Are you in fear for your life of this young woman? Do you have a sense of whether there was a concern for your safety or perhaps the safety of other students? The safety, I think, is a priority for all students, including myself. Um, and so it was made unclear to me because I received no details about what specifically the security threats were directed to. So the university has said that this is not a free speech issue. Do you view it that way? I think there's a nuance here. I think, you know, I expressed an opinion um, through a link that I had on my Instagram the hate and the vitriol that was unleashed towards me after, I think, was part of the reason that the university caved in. And so when it comes to being a free speech issue, sure, maybe my valedictory speech is a privilege, and it's a privilege I do not take lightly, and other students and evidently people around the world do not take lightly. But at the end of the day, my views the views that I have expressed and the views that USC has instilled within me as well um, were, were stifled and were subject to hate. You just brought up. Pause here for a second. So it was a post that she made on Instagram. And this is another thing I warned people about, that they are monitoring pro-Palestinian social media accounts, whether it's X. Of course, Facebook has been monitoring people for years uh, and TikTok as well, and also Instagram. So you have to remember Facebook owns Instagram, right? So they're monitoring these accounts. We don't really have a right to privacy in this country. We don't really have as much free speech as we say that we do or we think that we do. What a mess. A link that was posted uh, through your social media page. I, I do wanna ask you about that um, since you did bring it up. One of the items in this post uh, calls for the complete abolishment of Israel. Is that a position that you endorse? 
If you're asking me if I stand for human rights, if you're asking me if I stand for equality and unequivocal and unconditional right to life for all people, including Palestinians, then I'm not apologetic. I believe in what I believe, and it is because of the people around me that I've met at USC, the classes that I've taken, the professors that I have learned from, that have led me to look at the world in this way. And, you know, it's, an, it's unfortunate that, you know, human rights is controversial. The reason I'm pause for a second. First of all, yes, yeah, she did that, Miguel. Uh, that was a perfect answer. That was a perfect answer because yes, the problem here is that the Palestinian people are not even seen as, as people by the state of Israel. They're seen, they've called them animals. They're not even seen as, as human beings. They don't respect them. They don't feel that they should have the same rights. There is no idea of equality when you're looking at the state of Israel and how they view the Palestinian people. They don't see that. They don't feel the same. And that in itself is a serious problem. And she shouldn't even have to come on to CNN and explain that to people. And particularly to explain that to Abby, who is a black woman. She shouldn't even have to explain this to you, Abby. But again, Abby is reading a script that is handed to her by the producers of that show. Asking is because that's what the link said. It, it called for the complete abolishment of Israel. Abolishment of Israel was in the actual language. Is that something that you endorse? So the abolishment of the state of Israel, I'd like to clarify, is the abolishment of an apartheid system. It inherently is a system that subjugates Palestinians as dehumanized and it subjugates Palestinian life as not worth the same as other human life. So, so that's when a, the link says, so that's, is that a yes then? See, you notice that she had to interrupt her there because of what she said. She told the truth about the state of Israel, the Israeli government and how they view the Palestinian people. So, you know, she had to interrupt her there because this is a trap set up by Abby Martin or excuse me, Abby Phillips, <laughs> not Abby Martin. This is a trap set up here by Ali Abby Phillips. What Abby Phillips is trying to do is she is trying to get uh, Asna to admit that by saying that, that you're calling for the eradication of the state of Israel, she's trying to get to her to admit that she's calling for the eradication of Jewish people. That's what she's trying to do. So this is one of those traps that journalists or commentators will actually set up for the person that they're interviewing. And that's why I said the response that Osna gave was a perfect response, that you care about the humanitarian rights and the suffering of all people, that all people should be respected and treated as equals. I think a yes or a no would be an injustice to the issue. And I think that any sort of ideological debate or any sort of academic discourse is worth clarification and worth discussion. You're in a university environment and as a Muslim student, your experience is important and it matters. And as you said, you want the university pr to protect you. But I wonder about your Jewish classmates. Some of them have said that your selection to speak at their graduation has turned that event into an unwelcome and intolerant environment for Jewish students. What do you say to them? She was selected because she met the requirements. <laughs> do you know how hard, how difficult it is to become the valedictorian? <laughs> You're not just, you know, handpicked, like you have to meet certain requirements. They're saying that she is the best and brightest student of her class. That is why she was selected as the valedictorian. So she met the requirements. So there's that. But once again, this is another example of these universities and companies doing this as well, as these universities trying to paint Jewish people as the victim and nobody else. So what we really have is like this oppression Olympics here. Everyone, no one else oppression is important right now. I believe that every Jewish student at commencement deserves to be represented just as every other student at commencement. 
The position of having a valedictorian honor is supposed to be a unifying honor. And I believe that my commitment to human rights and my commitment to equal treatment should not be signified as or not be manipulated into an expression of disunity. Mm. I think when I, what I say mm -hmm. to my Jewish classmates is that your feelings are heard and I think that you're, you're entitled to your own positions on an ideological or on the basis of academic discourse. But when it comes to human rights and when it comes to the unequivocal and unconditional right to life, then I think that all USC students, because I have faith in my university that instilled these values in us, I believe that all USC students believe in that. Did you right. plan um, in your speech to talk about Israel and its actions? And if you had the opportunity to give it, what would you have said? So here we go in reference to what she would have said. Again, Abby is not interested in what she actually would have said. It's not like Abby is asking this question because she's she's curious. Oh, I wonder what your speech would have been. Abby doesn't care about this speech. This is another trap that is set up by Abby to try to see if there's something she would have said in this speech that would basically, you know, warrant the university removing her as the valedictorian. What you got to understand is Abby here and CNN, they're not on the side of the students. They're not on the side of the person who was removed. They are here to speak for the side of the University of Southern California, which is a, a hell of a damn good school, by the way. The fact that she got into uh, USC in itself is tremendous. You have to understand that is one of the top schools in the country. So Abby and CNN... The commentator and the network is there to protect the institution that is in place, and that is the university. They are not there to protect her. Once you go into these interviews, understanding that and realizing that they are always there to protect the institutions that are in place, the easier it will be for you to see what they are actually doing. That's a great question. So I actually had not started working on my speech at all if I were to be able to give a valedictory speech, you know, a message of hope. When it comes to me saying a speech, again, me taking a valedictory speech that is supposed to be unifying, I would definitely encourage and I would challenge and I would implore my peers to reconsider and to consider the ways in which their education can allow them and offer them the responsibility to look at matters of the world and take them into their own lens, make their own decisions and make their own assumptions and make their own, um, I want to say, you know, n not be told what to believe yeah. and then use, use, those, use those conceptions to make a change for the greater good. Asna Tabasam, thank you very much for joining us. And I should say congratulations to you on being the valedictorian. She shouldn't even have to go through this right now. She should be concentrating on, you know, uh, graduating from college and her valedictorian speech, you know, but look at what she's having to face right now. This could be the first face of many. There could be other students that this happens to as well. And what does this mean in reference to free speech in the collegiate system currently in this country? Just the other day. Columbia University, the president of this university, being questioned by Congress whether or not she believes that these phrases are anti-Semitic. Listen to what she says. You see, they're already, I told you, Harvard and Claudine Gay was just the beginning. It was not just about whether or not she pl committed plagiarism. OK, we got to understand Bill Ackman's daughter was a student at Harvard University. You also have to understand his wife was also accused of plagiarism. That was not what this was about. This was about centering Jewish students at these universities above everyone else. That is what they were really fighting for. And so you'll see from the president of Columbia University, listen to what she has to say when she is questioned. Watch how she just caves. The mobs shouting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, 
or long live the infantata, are those anti-Semitic comments? When I hear those terms, I find them very upsetting. And I have heard... That's a great answer to a question I didn't ask, so let me repeat the question. When mobs or people are shouting from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, or long live the infantata, are those anti-Semitic statements? Yes or no? It's not how you feel, it's... I hear them as such. Some people don't. We have sent so a clear yes? message. So that are mobs... Sh okay. So that was the, co the president of Columbia University. So you see, they got to her too. She went ahead and caved. But you have to understand again, those presidents of those universities, once again, they are not there to protect the students who are the customers of the university. They're not there to protect the students. They are there to protect the institution in place. And that is the university. And that's how they keep their jobs. Once you push back against the institution, they want to let you go. I know firsthand experience having worked in higher ed for over 10 years, which is why I do not work in higher ed anymore. I have firsthand experience with this. A lot of people think that these universities are like this lefty progressive haven, right? But when it comes down to business, which these universities have become, they are a business. They are very much conservative. And that's what people have to understand. Even so much that Medea Benjamin questioned <laughs> the president of the Columbia University and watch her walk away. Watch this. Any word for the Jewish students that weren't allowed to hear a hearing about anti-Semitism? Any word for the students that survived the terrorist attack using chemical weapons on your campus? Yeah. Do you have any word for the survivors of a terrorist attack on your campus? How does it feel to be in a room that did not allow for Palestinian Solidarity students to be here? This was a public hearing and you did not allow for the public to come in? Shame on you. Being pro-Palestinian is not anti-Semitic. We're outside the office here of the chairwoman of the Committee on Education that was hosting the hearing today with the Columbia University president. And uh, I was here at 8 o'clock this morning. There were students online. Um, they were the first students on the line. They were not allowed inside. This is the thing. They let in Jewish students who are pro-Israel through a back door, but not the pro-Palestinian Jewish students. So I talked to some of them and the message they seem to have gotten that was sent from the committee is that the committee feels that there's a right and wrong kind of Jew. And those that are left out in the hallway are the wrong kind of Jewish students. Virginia, given that there's an active case against Israel for genocide in the International Court of Justice, do you think it's a good idea to be wearing a pin supporting that country? Any word so, for the when you see these university presidents, what you have to understand is once again, just like our politicians are bought and paid for, so are the presidents of these universities. Who are the donors? Who's donating money to Columbia University? A lot of billionaires. Who's donating money to Harvard? A lot of billionaires and Harvard alum. So the similarities that you see within the university system, when you compare it to electoral politics and the political system that we have in this country, they're very similar. Instead of paying attention to what their customers want, they pay attention to what the donors want. And this is another reason why we have to get money out of the university system. We have to remove the donor class from the university system, period. And there's a lot of them that are donating to these universities that you may not be aware of. Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots, Michael Bloomberg, a lot of these people donating this money. And the moment that you do not go with the narrative that they want you to pursue, the moment that you do not move in the way that they want you to move, they will threaten not to donate money to the school again. And people need to start raising their hands and asking questions. Where is all that money that are going to these universities actually going? Because I can tell you from firsthand experience, it's not going in the places that you think that it would go. Some of these deans are making six figures. Some of the presidents at these universities are making over $1 million, $2 million a year. 
When I worked at Boston University, the president of BU was making over $2 million a year. He was making more than the president of Harvard. So people need to start pushing back on this. Get this money out of the university system. Get corporate money out of electoral politics. And then we can start to see some serious changes in this country. But as long as the universities like Columbia and Harvard, UPenn, Stanford, Yale, it's usually, usually the elite institutions, as long as they are controlled by the donor class, nothing is going to change in reference to the customer base. And the customer base at the university is the students. The customer base in electoral politics is us, the American people. And that's why our needs aren't met through electoralism. And that's why the student needs aren't met in the university system. We need a lot of changes to happen in this country, but one of the first ones that you can point to is money. Let's go to some of the comments here. Uh, Rondo says, because I know she's an intelligent young lady, so of course they are absolutely terrified of her. Absolutely. Lorez says, the whole system is rotten. Sebastian, the president at my last university makes over six figures while students like me can't afford a semester's tuition. And you're 100% correct. That's where a lot of this money is going, right? And if that means they got to throw a student under the bus or they have to remove a student like Asna as the valedictorian to basically please the donor class, because I'm pretty sure that's where the call came from. The call usually comes from the donor class, not the university. These things have got to change. A lot of that money is going to those deans and the presidents of the university. And if you've gone to a sports school, like I went to a sports school, a lot of that money is going to the coaches. You have college football coaches that are making over a million dollars a year. You got to look at where all this money is going. Um, Sebastian says, oh, excuse me. Tom says, uh, state funded, this would never happen. Old school says the Ivy League schools are an elite criminal training ground. Yes. And Credit is Born said universities are economic rent extraction schemes. 100%. I wish her the best of luck. I really do. But we got to start pushing back on these universities. Uh, NH Lieber says, when my son went to NYU 10 years ago, it was $40,000 per year. It is worse now. Mm -hmm. Even the University of Massachusetts, which is a public school system, is a, it's a public university. It's, it's ridiculously overpriced now for public school. Ridiculous. All right. We're moving on to this expose about the New York Times. I don't know if people have heard about this, but leaked information has been reported about the New York Times in reference to releasing information and how they treated their staff. This also applies to the war in Gaza. We're going to start with this clip here. It's a hot spot clip from my comrade Nick over at RBN. We'll start with this and then we'll get into that article from The Intercept. By the way, The Intercept has been leaking a lot of things this week. The past two weeks, The Intercept has been leaking a lot of information. Let's go into this. Reporters at the New York Times were told to not use language that humanized the Palestinians while Israel was committing their genocide. This is according to a leaked memo where editors was telling reporters at the New York Times to avoid using terms like genocide, ethnic cleansing, and occupied territories. This is an omission of guilt. The Zionists know exactly what they are guilty of. The New York Times is actively working with Israeli fascists in order to erase the identity of Palestinians. Reporters was told to not even use the term Palestine except in very rare cases. Reporters at the New York Times was also told not to use terms like massacre, carnage, and slaughter. The reasoning from the editors is that they don't want to convey emotion instead of information to their readers. This you hear that? They don't want to convey emotion. This is actual bullshit 
because we know they did not apply the same standard when they saw white people in Ukraine being murdered. Or whenever an IDF terrorist is killed by a Palestinian, then they are all for emotions. In fact, it was the New York Times who spread the October 7th mass rape hoax story that we are still dealing with to this day. We still have Western officials that cite the New York Times mass rape hoax story where even the parents of the October 7th victims said that the New York Times manipulated their family and deceived them in order to paint the story that their daughter was raped. All the reporters who demonized the Palestinians which helped led to the genocide that we've seen unfold should never be forgiven. Those hotspot clips are killing it. <laughs> Follow hotspot on Twitter. I think that it's at hotspot hotspot uh, on Twitter. Follow uh, hotspot and you'll see clips from Nick and Nico. They're killing it with those clips. But let's go ahead and dive into this article to get a little bit more information about this. Because again, this was leaked by Jeremy uh, Scahill at The Intercept. Leaked New York Times Gaza memo tells journalists to avoid words, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and occupied territory. <laughs> God knows. It is a mess. The New York Times instructed journalists covering Israel's war on Gaza Strip to restrict the use of the terms genocide and ethnic cleansing and to avoid using the phrase occupied territory when describing Palestinian land. That's according to a copy of an internal memo obtained by The Intercept. So here it is again. So we also have Zionism again controlling the narrative from the press. The New York Times is trash and has been trash. I think we can all agree to that. They've been debunked multiple times. I don't know if as many uh, people from my generation actually read the New York Times. Like I read it for the show to debunk it. But other than that, I don't know that my generation, the millennials are reading the New York Times uh, as much as people used to back in the day. Let's go in a little bit more here. The memo also instructs reporters not to use the word Palestine, except in very rare cases, and to steer clear of the term refugee camps to describe areas of Gaza historically settled by displaced Palestinians expelled from other parts of Palestine during previous Israeli Arab wars. In other words, the New York Times is trying to prevent their journalists from acknowledging history. They don't want that message to be released to the public. You know why? Because that makes the state of Israel look bad. Let's go on. The areas, uh, the areas recognized by the UN as refugee camps and house hundreds of thousands of registered refugees. The memo written by the Times Standards editor Susan Wessling. International editor Philip Pond and their duties offers guidance about some terms and other issues we have grappled with since the start of the conflict in October. While the document is presented as an outline for maintaining objective journalistic principles and reporting on the Gaza war, several times staffers told The Intercept that some of its contents show evidence of the paper's deference, or excuse me, deference to Israeli narratives. And they wouldn't be the only one. Remember, there was the story that was leaked by The Intercept that CNN actually had to run their stories across through Israeli state uh, government first before they actually reported on those stories. So again, you can see the method of control. You can see the method of censorship that is happening and is happening across all different outlets. I think it is kind I think it's the kind of thing that looks professional and logical if you have no knowledge of historical context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Now, that's coming from a Times newsroom source who requ they requested it to be anonymous for the fear of reprisal. But if you do know, it will be clear how apologetic it is to Israel. First distributed to Times journalists in November, the guidance which collected and expanded on past style directives about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been regularly updated over ensuing months. Its presence 
excuse me, it presents an internal window into the thinking of the Times international editors, and they have faced upheaval within the newsroom surrounding the paper's Gaza war coverage. Issuing guidance like this to ensure accuracy, consistency, and nuance is how we cover the news in standard, in standard practice. Across all of our reporting, including complex events like this, we take care to ensure our language choices are sensitive, current, and clear to our audiences. Issues over style guidance have been among a bevy of inter internal rifts at the Times over its Gaza coverage. In January, The Intercept reported on disputes in the Times newsroom over issues with an investigative story on systemic violence on October 7th. The leak gave rise to a highly unusual internal probe. The company faced harsh criticism for allegedly targeting Times workers of Middle East and North African descent, which Times brass denied. On Monday, executive editor Joe Kahn told staff that the leak investigation had been concluded unsuccessfully. WhatsApp debates. Almost immediately after October 7th, attacks and the launch of Israel's scorched earth against Gaza tensions begin to boil within the newsroom of over the Times coverage. Some staffers said they believed the paper was going out of its way to defer to Israel's narrative on the events and was not applying even standards in its coverage. Arguments began fomenting on internal Slack and other chat groups. So these were discussions that were held on other platforms among staffers. I'm pretty sure people have screenshots of this as well about how they were not happy with how the New York Times was choosing to go along with the Israeli uh, narrative in reference to this assault on Gaza and obviously leave out the narrative that is coming from the Palestinian people. And also it appears the history of how the Palestinian people uh, be became to be you know, captured in Gaza as well. Now, why is this really important? If you don't discuss the history then more people will just assume that this all began on October 7th. And one thing I continue to tell you is that it did not. This started decades ago. If you disregard saying, or if you refuse to say occupied, then it gives people the impression that the Palestinian people can move freely. That is not true. It gives people the impression that Israel is not an apartheid state and there's no apartheid present. That is not true. So the New York Times is trying to do the work of the Israeli government here. The debates between reporters on, Jer on the Jerusalem uh, Buru led WhatsApp group, which at one point included 90 reporters and editors, became so intense that Pan, the international editor, interceded. We need to do a better job communicating with each other as we report the news. So our discussions are more productive and our disagreements less distracting. Pan wrote that message on November 28th. At its best, this channel has been a quick, transparent, and productive space to collaborate on a complex, fast-moving story. At its worst, it is a tense forum where the questions and comments can feel accusatory and personal. He bluntly stated, do not use this channel for raising concerns about the coverage. It goes on to say here, among the topics of debate in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem Bureau WhatsApp group and exchanges on uh, Slack, reviewed by The Intercept and verified with multiple newsroom sources were the Israeli attacks on Al Shifa Hospital, statistics on Palestinian civilian deaths, the allegations of genocidal conduct by Israel and Joe Biden's pattern of promoting unverified allegations from the Israeli government as a fact. So this is something that the New York Times was doing. Pan did not respond to requests for comments. Many of the same debates were addressed in the Times Gaza specific style guidance and have been subject of intense public scrutiny. It is not unusual for news companies to set style guidelines. That's coming from another store, uh, source at the Times. But there are unique standards applied to violence perpe perpetuated by Israel. Uh, perpetrated by Israel. Oh, no, I said the right. Yeah perpetuated by Israel. Readers have noticed, and I understand their frustration. So listen to this, words like slaughter. So check this out. Um, the nature of the conflict has led to inflammatory language and incendiary accusations on all sides. 
We should be very cautious about using such language, even in quotations. Our goal is to provide clear, accurate information and heated language can often obscure rather than clarify the fact. So the New York Times in reference to accurate information, they're reporting on this particular conflict, but also others has been debunked multiple times since October 7th. So I don't know about the accuracy part there, obviously. Words like slaughter, massacre, and carnage often convey more emotion than information. But again, to Nick's point in his hotspot video, they had no problem using that language when describing Russia's war with Ukraine. They had no problem. When they were describing what was happening to the Ukrainian people, they had no problem using those types of words and wanting to invoke uh, emotion when it came to Ukraine. But when it comes to the Palestinian people, they don't want to evoke uh, emotion in their readers. And the reason they don't want to do that is because they don't want you to feel anything for the Palestinian people. It goes on to say, can we articulate why we are applying those words to one particular situation and not another? As always, we should focus on clarity and precision. Describe what happened rather than using a label. It goes on to say here, um, I want to dive into this part. Oh, we're going to scoot ahead. The analysis found that as of November 24th, the New York Times had described Israeli deaths as a massacre on 53 occasions and those of Palestinians just once. They are doing that because they want their readers to actually feel, you know, sympathy for the Israeli people. They're not willing to do that in reference to the Palestinian murders because they don't want the Palestinians to feel, they don't want people to feel sympathy for the Palestinian people. That's on purpose. It goes on to say the ratio for the use of slaughter was 22 to one, even as the documented number of Palestinians killed climbed to around 15,000. And it's not just the New York times. So they put out that narrative. And then when you see these debates on Pierce Morgan's uh, show, notice the pro Israel side is always like this massacre, this slaughter of the Israeli people. They're using the same vocabulary that was used by the New York Times to describe what has happened to the Israeli people. And that's how they control the narrative. And people read it, and then they repeat the same language. And then you'll see Zionists on different talk shows using that same language that was used in the New York Times article. And it spreads throughout all the networks and sources of information. And then the next thing you know, you're repeating that language as well. Even though if you just do a little bit of math and look at the numbers, it is very clear that more Palestinians have been killed than Israelis. You can't even make the comparison when you look at the numbers. But they're not willing to call over 30,000 people being killed in Gaza a massacre. But they are willing to use that in reference to the 1,200 people uh, killed at the concert. And that number has changed multiple times. The latest Palestinian death toll estimates stands at more than 33,000, including at least 15,000 children, likely undercounts due to Gaza's collapsed health infrastructure and missing persons, many of whom are believed to have died in the rubble left by Israel's attacks over the past six months. So this part right here, I want to dive into... We do not need to assign a single label or to refer to the October 7th assault as a terrorist attack in every reference. The word is best used when specifically describing attacks on civilians. We should exercise restraint and can vary the language with other accurate terms and descriptions. An attack, an assault, an incursion, the deadliest attack on Israel in decades, etc. Similarly, in addition to terrorists, we can vary that the terms used to describe the Hamas members who carried out the assault, attackers, assailants, gunmen. So to this point that they mentioned here, and they said that um, we can use the word terrorists to 
or best use it when it's specifically uh, describing attacks on civilians. Notice they didn't use that in reference to the attacks on the Palestinian people in Gaza, the civilians, all those 30,000 civilians that have been killed. You don't see them use that word because that would imply that Israel, that the IDF also are terrorists. So the media is controlled folks. And this is what I was saying, like the New York times are, they're not having a good year between the, 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 the report that came out about the article about the attacks on September, excuse me, October um, 7th, almost said September 11th, October 7th, and how that was debunked, that article was debunked by the gray zone, and then it was debunked by uh, the intercept. So the New York Times doesn't have a good reputation after that. And then the journalist that wrote that article, you have to remember it was revealed that she wasn't even a journalist until after October 7th. And she had also worked with Israeli forces before. Yeah, psh, no bias there. And then now you have this information that they were actually telling journalists that they could not use specific words to describe the death of the Palestinian people because they didn't want their readers to have empathy or compassion for the Palestinian people. It's all controlled. Let's go to some of the comments here. Thank you so much for the super sticker, blue moon, red wine. That's Lucy in the house. Thank you, Angela. Hashtag justice for Sade Robinson. Thank you so much for that. Uh, R. Davis says, New York Times is genocide washing. Exactly. And thank you, Freakazoid. My wife, who works for a local news sta station, got a similar memo on October 9th. So there you go. So Zionists put that call out. And that's what was heard around the world. Because it's not just the New York Times. They put this call out to other mainstream news outlets as well. And let's go ahead and give a shout out to Marcus Brockman for becoming a Savvy member. Let's give Marcus a big whoop, whoop. Whoopity whoop. Let's get the comments on Rockfin, Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much for the tip on Rockfin Hemp Car. The CIA relationships with the academic community are extensive and serve many purposes. Collaboration in research and analysis, intelligence collection abroad, and preparation of books and other propaganda materials. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Eric, just make sure we're moving the, patron the patrons. So I just moved the next one. All right. If you have not had a chance to do so, folks, go ahead and hit that like button. Thank you so much. And if you are new, don't forget to like, sub, and share. Thank you. Okay. We're moving on to something a little bit more, uh, I guess, laughable. And that is this debate that happened uh, with Don Lemon. Don Lemon actually hosted a panel uh, to debate about whether or not uh, Biden is the best choice for 2024. Now on this panel, he had obviously himself, uh, Cenk Uger from the Young Turks. He had David Pakman. I don't know why I would say it like that. David Pakman uh, hosted the David Pakman show and Brian uh, Tyler, who is you know also another Democrat supporter, host, et cetera. All of these people support the Democratic Party. Let's just keep it real. Cenk Uger is probably, I guess, to the left of the other guest, right? But in the end of the day, they're all supporting the Democratic Party. So just keep that in mind. We're going to play some of this. I want to start from the very beginning because it really bothered me when Don Lemon actually described uh, them a certain way. Let's get into this and I'm going to show you how this is laughable at best really laughable at best because some of the things that are said here are absolutely ridiculous let's go and here we are i don't know if to call you guys like don's angels i don't know that's something i'm not sure but jake brian david welcome to the program it, it, you know if the online uh left had a joint chiefs of staff i think it would probably be you three and <laughs> So let me just go ahead and pause there. So he referred to them as the online left. So let's go ahead and break this down, right? So you got David Pakman here, 
in the upper right corner. These people are not left. First of all, the Democratic Party is not left. We have to be very clear about that on the show. I'll continue to say this. The Democratic Party is not left. The Democratic Party is right wing. <laughs> Which people get that. So there is a difference between progressivism, socialism, Marxism, and being a part of the Democratic Party, which is supposed to be liberalism, neoliberalism, that support the war empire, that support corporations and the military industrial complex. At the end of the day, the Democratic Party is not left. So you have David Pakman up here, who was, of course, supporting Joe Biden. At one point in time, David Pakman used to be uh, more progressive. He used to support people like a Bernie Sanders. David realized it was more money to go mainstream, <laughs> to support the central, you know, centrist, more moderate candidate. And that's what David has been doing uh, in his days. David also just met with Kamala Harris in Washington, D.C. So again, you don't get to sit down in person with Kamala Harris in D.C., you know, being this radical person, someone who really wants the Democratic Party to change, you get to be there by simping for the Democratic Party. So that's why David was there. Then, of course, you have Brian Tyler Cohen. So he is the gentleman here, bottom right corner. Uh, he actually has interviewed people like Nancy Pelosi. Uh, you don't get to interview Nancy Pelosi. And he did it in person, in person, unless you were out here defending and carrying water for the Democrat party. And I mean the Democrat establishment part of the party. So just keep that in mind. And then you have Jink uh, Uger from the Young Turks, who's probably to the left of all of them. I will say that. But in the end of the day, Jink is also going to support the Democratic Party as well, which he'll mention here. He'll allude to that in just a second. So we're going to dive in here about whether or not to support Joe Biden. And this is where it becomes hilarious for me, folks. Some of the comments that you have made in, in recent days, you've been uh, incredibly critical uh, of President Joe Biden here. In recent days, you have even gone as far to suggest that you would vote for RFK Jr. instead of Biden. Really? Yeah, I'm considering it. Um, so uh, I don't know why people get out so outraged by this. And I, I know part of it is that it's a binary world. So when you say you're dissatisfied with Joe Biden, people go, oh, so you love Donald Trump? No, I, I hate Donald Trump. I don't know that anybody hates Donald Trump more than I do. Uh, having said that, that doesn't mean that Joe Biden doesn't have an awful, immoral, genocide supporting policy in Gaza. And I'm disgusted by it. And any decent person should be disgusted by it. So what am I supposed to say? Like, oh, Joe Biden's so great. No, I don't do propaganda. Joe Biden sucks. And his corruption is the same as all the establishment Democrats and establishment Republicans. They take hundreds of millions, actually, in the case of Biden, billions of dollars in corporate campaign contributions and pretend that the contributions don't uh, matter to them. So I I'm pause. So let's go ahead and, and call something out here, which Jink is, he, Jink is actually just exposing himself. So Jink said he's considering supporting RFK Jr. But some of those criticisms that he applied to Joe Biden also apply to RFK Jr. So you see people are just all over the place. So Jink Uger is telling you here that obviously he takes issue with Biden's complicit, you know, being complicit with the genocide in Gaza, which I think a lot of us do, right? I have a problem with that as well. I don't support Joe Biden either. But then you go and say that you're thinking of supporting RFK Jr. RFK Jr. is to the right of Joe Biden on Gaza. Make it make sense, folks. Doesn't make sense. He talks about uh, Joe Biden being corrupt, taking big money. But RFK Jr. has a super PAC. RFK Jr. is taking money from billionaires. So... Jank is, is contradicting himself. This makes absolutely no sense to me, right? The only reason I believe that Jank is supporting RFK Jr. is because RFK Jr. is polling significantly well uh, for an independent candidate. I believe that if RFK Jr. were polling at like 4%, he would not be considering supporting RFK Jr., right? If your issue is the war in Gaza that you have with Joe Biden, and of course, you know, Donald Trump 
would also be poor on this issue as well, then why aren't you supporting someone like a Jill Stein who is actually going to have the most ballot access, does have the most ballot access, and comes correct on this issue with Gaza? Because he's jumping on, considering jumping on the RFK train because he is polling the way that he is. Walking contradiction. Let's go on. I'm not ever going to grab pom-poms and cheerlead for Joe Biden. Now, in terms of RFK Jr., I'm not saying I'm going to vote for him. I'm saying I have begun to consider it. He's he's crazy on vaccines and conspiracy theories, etc. At the same time, he doesn't come in with a giant amount of corruption baggage. Like, pause. Notice he didn't say that his anything about RFK Jr.'s position on Gaza. Now, Jake has debated multiple people about Gaza. He has been on Pierce Morgan show to debate Zionists about Gaza. But notice when he mentions the problems that he has with RFK Jr., he does not mention Gaza at all. I hope everybody is paying attention to what's happening here. Exactly. Rose says, make up your mind. Exactly. Biden and Trump do. So that's just reality. And then where does that leave me? I don't know. I'm going to see how the campaign plays out. You have said that Joe Biden has been, quote, corrupt his whole life. I mean, what evidence do you have that Joe Biden is corrupt? 100 percent corrupt. I have overwhelming evidence. But I don't want people to think that I'm picking on Joe Biden as he's the only politician who's corrupt or that he's personally corrupt. I'm talking about systemic corruption. The problem with Donald Trump is he's personally corrupt and he can't wait to take money from Saudi Arabia and all these other places. We get that. We all understand that. Right. But so are we just going to forget about Joe Biden's business dealings in Ukraine? We're just going to forget about Joe Biden and Hunter Biden's business dealings in Ukraine. So let's talk about this, folks. Personal corruption versus institutional corruption. They're both corruption. <laughs> Does it really matter if you participate in institutional corruption versus personal corruption? And I would argue that Joe Biden also has personal corruption. So what he's doing here is he's still trying to make it seem like one is still better than the other. He's still trying to push the lesser of two evils without saying one is the lesser of two evils. You guys have got to pay attention to the way that people use their words and how they move. Because in the end of the day, I think that Jake Uger is still going to end up supporting and voting for Joe Biden. So this is him telling the audience, well, yeah, both Biden and Trump have corruption, but Trump's corruption is personal and Biden's corruption is institutional. So therefore, he is convincing the audience that Joe Biden is still the lesser of two evil. When it comes to Biden, people in mainstream media and the Democratic Party make what I view to be a totally insane statement, which is, no, he might have taken a billion dollars from corporate contributions, but he doesn't owe them any favors. And he doesn't let those donors affect them at all. Look, that's just nuts. So here I give, give you an example of the thing that I'm most animated about these days, which is Gaza. He's taken $11.2 million from APAC. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you guys think, but I think it's mental to think that he doesn't. Before I move on. But you're thinking of supporting RFK Jr. So let's be clear here, folks. There's no way that Jank Uger has not seen these videos of RFK with Rabbi Shmuley parading around the town. There's no way he hasn't seen this on Twitter. He's on Twitter way more than I am. There's no way he doesn't know about this. Why would he not admit that? Why would he not say that? And he's going to be called out for that, by the way. I understand that. Listen, I, I get it that you're upset about Gaza. That is understandable. A lot of people are upset and a lot of people have questions about policy as it relates to Israel and what's going on with Gaza. But to say that Joe Biden is corrupt, maybe he's taking advantage of a system that's already in play. But again, I'll ask you, what evidence do you have that Joe Biden is corrupt? Now, I, I, look, this is the thing that I... Now you have Don Lemon excusing, making excuses for Joe Biden being corrupt. Don Lemon is supposed to be independent now, but here he is still trying to make excuses for Joe Biden. I'm confused by you guys on and. So Joe Biden here, let's talk about one issue, but it applies to drug companies, oil companies, banks, every kind of corporate contribution. But in the case of Gaza, that's a good example. APAC has given him $11.2 million over the course of his career. They have, he's the number one uh, recipient of APAC money in United States Senate history. So my proposition, which I would, if you did a poll on it, my guess is 95% of Americans would agree. 
is that does that $11 million affect Joe Biden's unilateral, unconditional support of Israel throughout his entire career and today? 95% of Americans would agree with me. Of course, of course it affects his decisions. But yet all of mainstream media yeah. treats it as like corruption. How dare you? He's an angel who would never be affected by $11 million. Well, that, that's, not, that's not what I'm saying, Jink. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that could, he's- could I, could I jump in for a second? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Brian. Thank you. You, you're, you're, you're a straight talker. You know RFK is not going to win. He doesn't have a chance to win. But you also know that every vote that's not going to – don't uh, – Cenk, you know that RFK is not going to be the next president. I think we can all, like, speak plainly here. Um, I mean, I mean you're, you're trafficking in straight denial if you're actually – And then we have this guy, Brian Tyler Cohen, who, again, is, you know, Democrat – a supporter has interviewed people like Nancy Pelosi, like in person. So he also has connections within that DC bubble. And in order for him to maintain his position and can, and keep the show that he has and continue having uh, access to those politicians in DC, he has to continue to carry weight for the democratic party. So Brian just trying to make sure he feeds his pockets as well. These are the kind of things we got to continue calling out. We got to continue calling out. So, even though I don't support RFK Jr.'s campaign, what's interesting is that Brian said, you know this guy's not going to win, so you're only supposed to support something unless you know for sure it's going to win, unless you know for sure it's going to work. If that were the case, we would have never been able to build movements in this country. You think every time there was a protest or every time there was a strike, people knew for sure it was going to work? Most of the time it didn't. Most of the time there had to be multiple strikes that happen after that for the workers to get what they want. Most of the time with these movements, there had to be multiple protests, multiple boycotts for people who are activists to get what they want. So here's Brian basically telling you that he's not a fighter. Brian's not a fighter. Brian is not willing to actually fight for anything. Brian wants a winning ticket. He wants to go with what he know is going to work. Don't be like Brian. Claiming by shaking your head that you Can think I, that, that you want RFK Jr. has a chance. Well, question. I think just to just yeah. to if we're going to ask questions, I would say what is what are the five states he's most likely to have a shot in? Maybe we could start narrow. Yeah, guys, look, here, here's the deal. Do I know the third party candidates have a very, very low chance? Jill Stein, Cornell West and, and every other election. Of they have, course, they have no of chance. course, I'm not a, no I'm chance. not a person who denies reality in any way, shape or form. Having said that, this election is kind of like the Ross Perot election where a third party candidate actually has a legitimate chance because both of the candidates are despised. So if a Mark Cuban or a John Stewart were to come in, I think they win the whole damn thing. RFK Jr. is a pretty weak candidate, so he has a much lower chance. But even so, he's pulling at 10, sometimes at 20 percent. So if you think that has no chance, I think you're wrong. Does it, is it a high chance? No, of course not. I have here's, a couple of... Oh, go ahead, Brian. Here's Sorry, the, yeah. the, broader question, the broader question I want to ask is, like, knowing that this is like very likely not going to happen, you have more you have more uh, likelihood of being able to persuade to push Joe Biden, especially on these issues that you're passionate about, than you would if Donald Trump became president, which would be the likely outcome by throwing support behind someone like okay. RFK. You think you think Joe Biden is bad on Gaza. What do you think Donald Trump would do to Palestine, to Gaza if he became the next president? Hang on. Jake. So here's Brian Tyler Cohen trying to the lesser of two evils of a genocide. So Brian is basically telling you, I understand there's a genocide happening in Gaza, but it would be even worse if Trump were in office. We shouldn't sit up here and debate over the lesser of two evils of genocide. Do you see where this two party system has gotten us as a country, as a society? We should not have to debate this. It should be common sense and people should use their brain. But again, Brian is saying what he is paid to say. There's a reason why Brian gets to go to DC and sit down with these politicians face to face because he is supposed to be the one, and you can add Roland Martin to that list as well, to carry water for the Democratic, Dem Democratic Party and to make sure that he convinces his audience that you do still have to go out there and support them. And that's how he maintains that access. And that's how Brian gets to keep that show.
Or you that. answer. I mean, uh, we're, all, we're all saying this as if, like, from the luxury of a bunch of guys sitting here while abortion bans are being passed uh, across the country. Right. We yeah. just talked about an 1864 abortion ban that was just upheld in Arizona. If Donald Trump becomes the next president, then forget Arizona. We're going to have a nationwide abortion ban. That is not true. And I don't support Donald Trump, but I don't think that's true. Because what I've seen from him is that he wants to keep it left up to the states. I don't think he would do that. I think he knows better. So you see this? So Brian is here to fear monger you about Trump derangement syndrome. In California, New York, Vermont. I mean, we have the luxury of not having to worry about that in this conversation right here. But there are women across the country who will lose that luxury by virtue of you know, having imposing purity tests on certain candidates. That is, that is true. That is true. But hang on, Jake. I want David to jump in because I want to hear. Genocide is now a purity test. You guys heard this? Here we say yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, listen, on, on the on the RFK um, uh, math, first of all, I mean, I've been seeing what some of his advisors have been saying. One of them's talking about how his path to victory goes through California. Uh, I've looked at the math in California. He'd have to take half of Biden's and one third of Trump's support. I mean, I think that it is a mathematical impossibility. Jenk and I have talked about the math of this before on my show, and we, we may just disagree about what's likely versus what's probable. On the corruption thing, I actually agree with Jenk that every single person who has been president has both benefited from and accepted the status quo of campaign finance, the way politics is financed, super PACs, all of it. And also because we have a Republican Party that has spent years now wasting millions in taxpayer money looking for supposed bribe criminal bribery that they still have no evidence of. James Comer is privately admitting in fundraising emails. We're not going to impeach the guy. It's just not going to work. I think it's important to be responsible and talk about how Jenk pointing out the corruption of the system is totally different than Joe Biden being guilty of any things they're personally accusing him of. And then lastly, and, and then I'll you know. stop it, David. Let, let me ask you a question, guys. OK, if you participate in the corruption, you are corrupt. When you make statements and say that you would veto Medicare for all bill if it came across your desk and then we look and see you're getting all this money from Big Pharma. That's a problem. You are corrupt. When you are taking money from the Israeli lobby, your entire political career, that is corrupt. Obviously, you are going to legislate in a way that benefits the state of Israel and no one else. There's problems there. When there are issues with you being involved with your son, Hunter Biden's business dealings with Burisma in Ukraine, that is corrupt. So David is also paid to carry water for the Democratic Party at all costs. He is here to defend Joe Biden and anyone in that position at all costs. That's what he's paid to do. So I can't even believe you have to sit here and debate people about whether or not to support someone who's complicit in a genocide. I can't believe it. And to prove that I'm right, I am willing to bet if it was Donald Trump who was sitting in that seat right now and this genocide was happening, they'd be saying the exact opposite. David Pakman would tell you, you can't. No, 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 don't. He's complicit in the genocide. But because it's a member of his own party that is doing it, he's going to make excuses for them. That's another reason why people need to leave these parties. Are you going to stand by your morals and your own principles? Or are you going to go along with what the party wants? You know, go back to, to this other stuff. I don't want to vote in a way that is, uh, I, I'm, su I'm a super simple and pragmatic guy. My vote in New York or Jenk and Brian's votes in California aren't actually going to quote matter in the sense that neither of those states will be close. Biden's going to win all of them. I actually think of the three options. Biden's the best option. So that's who I'm voting for rather than calculating message sending or whatever. And on Gaza. So 
he, genocide is the best option? Genocide is the best option. And I want to prove a point. Yes, he's in New York. David Pakman is from Massachusetts, but he's in New York. He lives in New York now, from what I understand. But I want to prove a point. If he knows that his state is going to go to Joe Biden anyway, then technically David Pakman doesn't need to vote for anybody. But he's still telling people to support Joe Biden because that's what he's paid to do. The moment David Pakman would say, don't support him, guys, you can't support him because of the genocide. David Pakman would probably lose a lot of his audience. He would probably lose some of the sponsorships that he has. And he probably wouldn't have any more meetings with Kamala Harris in D.C. So there's that. So, yes, someone like him who lives in New York, which is a blue state and is mainly blue because of New York City. If you go to upstate New York, you'll see a lot of those areas are actually red. It's going to go to Joe Biden. So David doesn't actually have to go and support anyone. Of. And then lastly, and, and then I'll you know, go back to, to this other stuff. I don't want to vote in a way that is, uh, I, I'm, su I'm a super simple and pragmatic guy. My vote in New York or Jenk and Brian's votes in California aren't actually going to quote matter in the sense that neither of those states will be close. Biden's going to win all of them. I actually think of the three options, Biden's the best option. So that's who I'm voting for rather than calculating message sending or whatever. And on Gaza, if one is concerned about the pa the prioritization of the Palestinian people, RFK would be worse based on everything I've heard him say about the conflict. And he got jink there. So I told you he was going to be called out about that. Jenk Uger was going to be called out because, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. What Jenk Uger said there. How you let David Pakman call you out, Jenk? Like, seriously, it did not make any sense. And Trump would be even worse. So even on that, the best options Biden. Yeah. And Jenk. David is right. When I said that he may be taking advantage of a system that's already in place, he articulated that much better than, than I did. I don't, you, what, what people. I just have to debunk something really quick and we'll get back to this. Um, the best option would not be RFK Biden or Donald Trump. The best option, if we're looking at how they, how they fare on that issue and ballot access, the best option would be Jill Stein. But there's a reason why they're not mentioning Jill Stein name. The same reason why you haven't seen Jill Stein on democracy now, like you did last time that Jill Stein ran for office, because they know that she's the one that has the most ballot access that's running as a third party or independent candidate. And she's the one that is the bigger threat. RFK Jr. may be polling higher, but without that ballot access, that's not going to mean as much when it comes time to vote in November. Jill Stein being a part of that Green Party, she's already got a lot of states in reference to ballot access. And I would pretty much willing to bet she's going to have over 40 states come November for ballot access. That is why they're not mentioning her. That's why they're not including her as a part of this equation. Notice this. Why don't you see Jill Stein on Chris Cuomo's show on News Nation? He's brought Dr. West on multiple times. He's interviewed RFK multiple times. Why hasn't he interviewed Jill Stein? In fact, I would actually challenge Chris Cuomo to interview Dr. Jill Stein. Everybody paying attention to this? All these candidates that have appeared on The Breakfast Club, why hasn't The Breakfast Club brought on Dr. Jill Stein? Because she has the most ballot access. So they're trying to do a media blackout of Jill Stein so that people are not paying attention to her. I think when you say Joe Biden is corrupt, that he's personally corrupt, right? Not that he's part of a system that you're pointing out the flaws in that system. But I listen, I spoke with D.L. Hughley. He said something very similar to what David said, and, and I, we'll, we'll play the soundbite for you. I had a dinner with him and told him and the vice president the same thing. Uh, and I said, but the problem is I don't live in Gaza. I live in the United States of America. And I'm not going to, as a protest vote, make my, my children's life harder. I'm not going to. Dumbest statement I've heard from D.L. Hughley. And why are you taking political advice from a celebrity? You know, it just, 
I don't live in Gaza. I live in California. This is why they'll interview celebrities about this issue because they know a lot of times they don't know as much about it or they're not paying attention to as much politics. This is the dumbest thing I ever heard. Dumbest thing. Don't you understand, D.L. Hughley? Don't you understand that what is happening to the Palestinian people could happen to any other group of people in the world? I don't live there. I live in California. If something happens in Texas, let actually let's use Louisiana. When Hurricane Katrina happened, those of us that didn't live in Louisiana, we could have just shrugged our shoulders and say, I don't live there. I live in New York. I don't live there. I live in Maine. Does that mean we should ignore the suffering of the people? Does that mean that we shouldn't try to do everything that we can to stop those people from being oppressed and occupied? That is one of the most selfish statements I've heard. Very selfish. Uh, give my, uh, my, my uh, vote to somebody uh, in, in a protest, in a, from a protest perspective, that would empower people that only want to make my children's life. I can't think of one group of people wants to give you guns and abortion to, to rid you of any uh, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. It's just a lot of things. Like in a, at one point in America, it was illegal for slaves to learn. Now in many places, it's illegal to learn about slaves. That's a mindset. And so there are a lot of things that bother me, but I think where I see people, uh, where I have a clear kind of uh, line of sight is where I think what will be best for the future of of my children, my grandchildren. What? His children's future will be fine because he's rich. You know, let, let's stop pretending that D.L. Hughley is in the same, the same boat as the rest of us. Let's not sit here and pretend like he's working class or he's out there, you know, working, struggling, working two jobs to make ends meet. Let's not go there because he's not. So they are interviewing celebrities that are pro democratic party to try to get people to still come out and support Joe Biden. They're interviewing rich celebrities who are not infected or excuse me, uh, affected. I said infected affected the way that a lot of us are today by the grocery store prices. They can afford to pay more at the grocery store. They can afford to pay more at the gas gas pump. They can afford to pay more folks. And this is who they're getting opinions from. What do you say yeah. to that? So yeah. I have so many things to say here. First, let's start out with, we are not deciding who we're voting on today. If you guys have already decided and you say, okay, Joe Biden, we, we bow to you. We serve you. We will, we will do whatever you want. I'm not in that camp. Okay, so he's got to earn my vote, Neither earn am my I. support, and he has not done that at all. Okay, so that's point one. But yes, on election day, if if Kennedy RFK Jr. is still around ten points, that means he has zero percent chance of winning. It applies to Cornell West, Jill Stein, etc. Then I'm going to make a decision between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and I'm never going to vote for Donald Trump. So there you go. Okay, let's go back for this a little bit. So this whole thing about he's considering voting for RFK Jr., this is what I wanted you to see. This is why I told you, at the end of the day, they're still going to support the Democratic Party. And that's why they're on this show. I'm not in that camp, okay? So he's got to earn my vote. Neither am my I. Support, and he has not done that at all, okay? So that's point one. But yes, on election day, if, if Kennedy, RFK Jr. is still around 10 points, that means he has 0% chance of winning. It applies to Cornell West, Jill Stein, et cetera. Then I'm going to make a decision between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I'm never going to vote for Donald Trump. So, so there you go. So as I said earlier, Jink Uger, Jank Uger is going to tell you to vote for Joe Biden. That's in the end. He is still going to support Joe Biden. All this talk on all these different shows that he goes on to to whine and, and he, he vents and he says he's upset about Biden in reference to Gaza and all that kind of stuff. None of that is going to matter at the end of the day. But he just told you he is still going to support Joe Biden without telling you he's going to support Joe Biden. What? Did I tell you? This is a game. This is a game that Jake is playing. You know, like I said, he is further to the left than the other two hosts, but this is a game that he's playing. 
And he's playing it with TYT viewers too, to sit up there and get their hopes up, to make them think he might actually support a third party or independent candidate. No, at the end of the day, he's gonna support Joe Biden. He just lets you know. So there you go. We'll go a little, go on a, a little bit more here. There you go. Okay, but at this point, we're not anywhere near there yet, and we've got a third party candidate that's in double digits. In terms of Joe Biden uh, being able to be pushed, I haven't seen it. So on on Israel and Gaza, he can't be pushed at all. No matter what he, uh, what we do, no matter how many, like there's literally a million Palestinians starving to death. There's thirty three thousand dead already, and Joe Biden is saying no, send them $14 billion more to do more genocide. That's not a little issue. That's a giant, giant moral issue. And I do not want to fund a genocide. So you're not gonna move me off that position. But David is right uh, that unfortunately, all three candidates are awful on Gaza. They're all despicable. I, I had the- Let me pause here for a second, okay? Awful on Gaza, despicable. And he continues to pretend like there aren't other candidates that are running that are not awful on that issue. Again, that is on purpose. How many people are watching Don Lemon's uh, Twitter show? How many people are watching this show of Don Lemon on YouTube? So again, the message that is being delivered to the American people is still that Joe Biden is the lesser of two evils. That is the message they're pushing. We do not be fooled. Do not be fooled by the passion that Cenk Uger has for Gaza and believe that that is going to push him to not support the Democratic Party in November. At the end of the day, it's theater for some and money for others. David and Brian's statements don't surprise me. David's statements would have surprised me a couple years ago when he was still calling himself a progressive and he was supporting you know, someone like a Bernie Sanders. But their statements don't surprise me. They're full on establishment Democrat participants. They acknowledge this. They're out there simping for Biden. They're paid to do it. Jake, on the other hand, is actually trying to allude to the fact and give his, his audience members hope that he could possibly entertain the option of a third party or independent candidate. But he just let you know, at the end of the day, he will still back Joe Biden. So it's all for theater, folks. It's all for theater. And they're doing that so that they can still maintain some of their liberal base. I'm not stupid. I didn't grow up yesterday. I know exactly what they're doing. And don't believe it or not, I used to believe TYT's base was mainly progressive. There are a lot of liberals that watch TYT. There's a lot of liberals that watch Roland Martin. A lot of liberals that watch... Uh, David Pakman and Brian Tyler Cohen. And the moment they were to be to tell you to move away from that and give the third party independent chance an option, they would lose a lot of that base. And they're not going to risk that at all. So it is what it is at the end of the day, folks. And we're going to talk about this on uh, Zoom. I believe the link is pinned I forgot to do this poll. I was going to poll you guys and ask you, and I forgot. I was going to poll you and ask you, which platform do you prefer for like these call-in shows? Rather, would you prefer Zoom still or Twitter spaces? I don't, I typically don't do Twitter space because it's wild over there. But also I know some of you don't have a Twitter account. So that's why I have the Zoom. So we're still gonna do Zoom for today, but for those of you that joined the Zoom show, let me know if you would prefer a different platform now that we don't have a uh, call-in anymore, but that's where we've kind of been hanging around. I do have to take just a quick break. I'll come back and we'll head on over to Zoom. All right. All right, so um, yeah, I'm dark today. Let's see, yeah, it's because I got the uh, the backlighting in the window at this time of day. But uh, let's see, get a little closer to the camera. All right, so this is where we give our savvy a little a little break before we jump over <clears throat> to the segment here that used to be calling, and now we're doing it on Zoom. Um, you should see the. Um, um, the, the link for the Zoom room, which Sabi will be opening soon. Um, and um, um, 
And yeah, we, we can we can try to post it in the chat too. And hey, everybody in the chat, everybody around, and uh, Sabi will pop back in soon, and then we'll we'll get the Zoom room going. Um, I see in the chat um, uh, saying, "How do I find you on Zoom?" If you um, um, if you look at, at the chat that's here, here actually, I can uh, I can paste it into the chat. Let me do that too. But uh, but it's a link, and then you can bring it up on the chat. It's also possible to like uh, bring it up on your computer. Here, I'm just paste copying, pasting. There it is in the chat as well. And we'll and so we used to, we used to do it on Colin, and then now Colin's been discontinued because um, uh, Rumble bought it, and um, and I think wasn't making enough money off of it, so they uh, so they axed it. And so now we're doing it on Zoom, which I think works pretty well. A lot of times I'll uh, I'll put the camera on my cat Kiva, and um, and she basically becomes the star of the Zoom. So you might see Kiva in there. We'll see. I don't know where she is. Meanwhile, let's see. We got some um, some comments that came in here. JB Font, yeah, I think talking about the uh, the, the panel here um, that would uh, on Don Lemon's show, like like what isn't. Why would anyone watch that Don Lemon show? It's kind of, um, these are not leftists. I see one anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist on the screen. Left is anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. Imperialist. These gentlemen, not so much. Yes, as usual, a good point there by Mr. J.B. Font. Yeah, I mean, on, on that panel, it's, um, you know, I, I see... Um, Jenk just as as being like like a fake opposition, and it's it's um it's a little bit concerning, a little bit dangerous because Jenk Jenk knows how to how to leverage some of the language. You know, he's talking about corruption, he, he's talking about these things, but he's not um but he's not real about it. I mean, at the end, he's going to take the money like the rest of them, like he did with um, the Katzenberg money for, for TYT, but he's, he's levering, leveraging that language and he's, he's a fake opposition, which is actually kind of dangerous. Uh, thanks for the super chat and why varsity sports um, wait until August approaches. Zank is going to jump on that. Trump is an, is an existential threat faster than you can say sell out. Agreed with there and why varsity sports and we'll probably we'll see if we see him in the Zoom meeting and where we get to hear from you all. Um, and Tia saying, uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, she put this in that that was a good. Job. She said, tell us how much success Sanders has had in pushing Biden left. Yeah, that whole thing of you know that we can actually like like do that. And at this point, I mean, my what I laugh about is um, the idea of like. Um, uh, at this point, we can't even push uh, Sanders left. Uh, I'm going to change the camera. This camera is too dark. I'm going to go to my uh, it's my laptop camera, which isn't great, but at least. Oh, wait. Which camera is this? All right. Is that camera? Sorry, I'm playing with cameras. Does this camera work? There we go. All right. That's a little better anyways. Uh, let's see what else we got up here on the board. Um uh, let's see. Thanks for the super chat, Chris. Uh, Chris Eero. All of this ponti pontificating and posturing is a waste of time. All of them, including Don, will still vote to uphold American imperialism. Even worse, most of their supporters will blindly follow. Yeah, I mean that's a good point, Chris. And you know, I, I think it's up to us, you know, here on the real left, to uh, to make something happen. Um, thanks for this super chat. Uh, DC, all political parties are corrupt and all rig the primaries. And this one, Green Party's primaries are as fake as the DNC's. And also, thanks for the super chat, DNC, uh, DC as well. Uh, DNC fraud lawsuit ruling applies to all parties. Yeah, I mean, not, you know, it kind of got, got me thinking, you know, that the about Jill's run and, and the Green Party and, you know, Firstly, like the, the Green Party is, is a very different animal from the, the from the Uniparties. I mean, the the real the Republican and Democrat parties. I mean, they are just totally the, the servants of the that top point one percent class. You know, they they serve the, the billionaire class, and you know, you really can't say that about the Green Party. And it, I mean, it may not be perfect, but you know, I in, in a sense, I mean, what I would say is I, I really don't. I almost don't care about the Green Party. I mean, I wouldn't say I would. 
it's I'll put it this way. It's not about the Green Party. It's about having someone on the ballot that you can actually vote for and not feel that they're totally corrupt and sold out. And so if the Green Party is the vehicle that gets Jill Stein on the ballot as an option and that those of us who who are ready to bust up this corrupt system who are really ready to do it, unlike a Cenk Uger, but are really ready to do it, that she's on the ballot and that we can vote for that option, which I, you know, I see as a good option. And, you know, if the Green Party is, is the way to get there, then, you know, I think it's a good way to go. Um, also on Cenk, I wanted to, uh, to also show this bit of his, um, his fakery here and his nonsense. You know, here he is on Twitter, when was this? Um, April 14th, um, you know, pumping up Joe Joe Biden's tires. Credit, you know, and, and so this is what Cenk Uger just tweeted a few days ago. Credit to Biden so far for trying to cool everything down. U.S. did a great job of protecting Israeli citizens and knocking down the Iranian missiles. But Biden has drawn the line on going on offense. He said he won't help Israel do that. That's exactly right. Good job so far. You know, so I mean, it's pretty clear, like, like what what Jenk really thinks of, of Biden. He's going to bend the knee. He's going to support him. Sorry, just playing with my, uh, there we go. He's going to bend the knees and, and support him. And, you know, he's going to be fake. Um, we had the story earlier about um, the, uh, the New York times and, you know, it, it is a shame, you know, what's happened to the times and, and, and how far it, how, how far it's dropped. I think of like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember Savvy the old uh, there's a, the old Chomsky quote where I think somebody asked him um, back when Chomsky was good <laughs> um, like you know does the does the the newspapers like the New York Times do they tell the truth and what Chomsky said is well if you kind of hold it up to the light and 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 fold it and put it just the right way you could kind of find some truth in there <laughs> but it's basically you know very much framed and very much uh, propagandized and the other thing i wanted to say is if you want to know what with, with someone like like jank or these others whether or not they're for real or whatnot a way to do that is to have that clear set of demands right you have you have a clear thing of, of demands and saying this is what we need and and when, so when you're evaluating a, a candidate or even a person like Jenk, you can you can go through that and you could say, well, no, they don't they don't pass these demands. And then you say, like, no sale. And when you know, and even when you have a candidate like a Stein or a Cornell West that that looks really good, well, you know, are they meeting our demands? You know, that's that's going to be uh, the test. And we can talk about that on Zoom. And of course, yeah. about the oh. Max interview we talk about. Yeah, we can talk about the the Max Blumenthal interview. We can talk about um, uh, the University of Southern California student that was just uh, banned from being the valedictorian. We can talk about that. Um, what else did we cover today? Oh, the New York Times article. And of course, um, the uh, Don Lemon panel here. Uh, yeah, we could talk about that. So that link is uh, pinned to the top of the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and start the zoom. Now I'm just going to open it while I'm on the stream. Um, I, just, um, I just pasted it into the chat and I also, I, I pasted it into the rumble chat as well. Poor, poor rumble. We, we forgot about them last time. They're saying, give us the link. Oh yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. Um, Maybe you should, um, if you can, uh, uh, send it to the mail list too. Yeah, I can also send it to. Can everyone on Zoom mute? <laughs> everyone on Zoom should mute. Everyone on Zoom should mute. Okay, good. <laughs> I was just telling everyone on Zoom to mute. Um, like the old radio shows. Respect our seven second delay. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then uh, we're admitting everybody here. Okay, great. It looks like it's working for people. That's the passcode up there if you need it. It's also uh, pinned to the chat as well. And you said I could send this out. Um, I guess Substack, I'll send it out there as well. As well. Get a crew in here. Call in on on. Do you Zoom. have to let people in one at a time? 
I don't know why it's doing that. It didn't used to do that, but you can just hit yeah. admit all. Maybe it's an option. Everyone, please mute. Everyone, please mute. I don't know who it is, but everyone, please mute. Okay, good. Yeah, make sure you're muted when you join. And then um, the other thing is if you want to speak, the way we did this last time was if you want to speak, just click on the little emoji under uh, reactions. If you click on that, there's a, a, a reaction for raise your hand. You just click on that and that's how I know um, if you want to speak or not. And then let me just make sure I can share this on um, Substack as well. Let's see, click. Uh, I don't know who that is, but can you mute? Um, well, we can probably shut down the YouTube stream and then we'll get probably less of that echoing. So, okay, I think we're good here. All right, all, all right. right, guys, Bye. good night. <laughs> Keep up the fight. Whee!